Section 1 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. Introduction. The Prayer. Thou art, O God, the High and the Holy One, who inhabitest us eternity, and the praises thereof. Do thou impress us aright with a sense of thy greatness, as contrasted with the littleness and the limitation of all our faculties, and do thou impress us aright with a sense of thy sacredness, as contrasted with the exceeding sinfulness of our nature. May we be clad with humility. In studying the lessons of thy word, may we evince all the duteousness and the docility of children. May we sit at the feet of him who is meek and lowly in heart, and seeking at his mouth the revelations of thy blessed will, may ours be the blessed privilege of those who hear and believe and obey. 1. The work of Butler on the analogy of religion, natural and revealed, to the constitution and course of nature, is one of the best cures for infidelity I know, and one of the best preservatives against it. Or rather, instead of a remedy for unbelief, it may be termed a most effectual remedy against disbelief, for there is a most weighty and important difference between these two things. One might have no positive reason for affirming the truth of a given doctrine, in which case it is the proper object of unbelief, but he might have as little positive reason for affirming its falsehood, in which case it cannot be the object of disbelief. There is many an imaginable object in nature, of which we cannot say that it positively is, but of which we can as little say that it positively is not. Were we to assign for such objects a place in the mind, we should say that they lie neither in the region of belief nor in the region of disbelief, but along an intermediate line between these two, as being the objects of neither the one nor the other, but simply of unbelief. For an example of this, we can allege it as a conceivable thing, that there rolls a planet in our system between Mercury and Venus, but still invisible to us because too small for the observation of our most powerful telescopes. Who can affirm this in the absence of all substantive proof? Yet who, it may still more emphatically be said, who can deny it? We cannot say that such a planet is, and still less can we say that it is not. But at the very least we can say that, for aught we know, it may be. We have not yet discovered it in the region of the actuals, but neither have we so thoroughly explored that region as to qualify us for affirming that it is not there. Its true place or category is in the region of the possibles, its right logical position being the midway or ambiguous state of pure scepticism. 2. We cannot yet say of any intermediate planet between Mercury and Venus that it is, but it is not without design that we have employed the words that still less can we say that it is not. The time may yet come when, on the strength of one simple observation by a competent instrument directed to its place of little room in the heavens, we shall be enabled to descry such a body, and so to make positive affirmation of its real and substantive existence. But we do not see how we shall ever be enabled to make positive affirmation of its non-existence. For the assertion that it is we may have but to allege the definite finding of some one astronomer, which, with our knowledge of its path and quarter in the firmament, we can repeat at any time. But for the sweeping assertion that it is not, we should have to make a sweeping survey and exploration of that mighty annular space, amounting to millions and millions more of square miles, which lies between the orbits of these two planets, and to report that throughout the whole of this vast extent, a moving body so small as to have escaped all our former methods of discovery is nowhere to be found. Such often is the momentous difference between the establishment of a proof and the establishment of a disproof. It might require but one finding to ascertain of a given thing that it exists somewhere, but it might require an infinity of findings, and that too in places to us inaccessible, to ascertain that it exists nowhere and if there be one department of truth where this principle is of surest and most obvious application, it is when brought to bear on the things of faith and eternity. One would need to compass the outskirts of immensity, and to have traversed all within them, ere he could pronounce a negative on these things. By one single manifestation might God make himself authentically known to us, but for us positively to state that there is no God, no Jesus Christ, no angels, and that there has been no creation and will be no day of judgment, 
This implies a mastery on our part over all space and all time. In the things of religion, belief must have its own proper and precise ground to rest upon, else it is a presumption. In the absence of any such ground, there is no presumption but the contrary, in unbelief. There is a disbelief, again, the presumption of which is tremendous, a usurpation of omniscience. 3. Yet there is a warrantable disbelief even in the matters of religion. If I have valid evidence for a certain proposition and believe it accordingly, then am I not only an unbeliever but a disbeliever in its opposite. If I have a direct observation that the wind is blowing from the north, I must be a disbeliever in the proposition that it is blowing from the south, and also a disbeliever in the truth of him who tells me so. If I have reason to know that God cannot lie, then will I not only be an unbeliever, but a disbeliever in the professed revelation, which tells me that he does lie. I must be a disbeliever in all which is specifically the opposite of that which I do believe, and if such belief be well grounded, then such disbelief must be equally well grounded. I cannot believe that the wind now blows from the north without disbelieving that the wind now blows from the south, which is another proposition altogether than that the wind never blows from the south. A disbelief in the singular or specific proposition that the wind now blows from the south might be perfectly warrantable, while disbelief in the universal proposition that the wind ever blows from the south would be monstrously presumptuous and unwarrantable because it were disbelief, not as before in a specific or singular, but in a universal negative. It is true that the proposition God cannot lie may be held as a universal negative. 4. There is more or less of this presumption in all the enemies of our faith. For example, we should deem it immensely arrogant in the creatures of a day to pronounce of the unseen and everlasting God that he never does or can act in a particular way, that he never has adopted and never would adopt such or such a method of administration. Ere one can be warranted in speaking or in thinking thus, he would need both to have observed and studied the divine government in all the vastness of its extent, and throughout all the endless variety of its manifold and multiform processes, and yet it is on such an implied acquaintance with the infinite and the everlasting that a great part of our infidelity is based. As an instance of this, it is alleged, and with all confidence, by adversaries of the Christian religion, that God would never make the innocent suffer for the guilty, and therefore, because this procedure is ascribed to him in the Bible, they would charge upon that book a false representation of the deity, and so deny it to be a genuine communication from heaven to earth. 5. There are two ways of meeting this objection. The first is by taking account of the actual and positive credentials which might be alleged on the side of this professed revelation as being a message from God. Its miracles, supported by the best and amplest of human testimony, its prophecies, substantiated by the history both of the anterior writings and their posterior fulfillments, its many discernible signatures of goodness and sacredness and truth, as palpably standing forth in the pages of this record, its minute and marvellous consistencies both with itself and with contemporaneous authors, such as no impostor could ever have maintained, above all its felt adaptations of the wants and fears and longings of the human spirit, and the sense and perception of which are often given in answer to prayer, as to constitute the evidence to an inquirer of a most distinct and satisfying revelation to himself. These are what form the great bulk and body of the Christian evidences, and what distinguishes them from such of the objections of deism, as have now been specified, is that they are founded not on what we conceive of the ways of God, but on what we observe and can verify of the ways of man, or on what the characteristics of truth and falsehood are in human witnesses, human histories, and human experience. In other words, the arguments for our Bible revelation are grounded on the certainties of a familiar and oft-explored territory. The arguments against it are so many imaginations fetched from the obscurities of a distant unknown. It is competent for us to sit in judgment on the conduct of our fellow men, and this judgment, whether it have respect to its first teachers as in estimating the historical evidence, or to its present disciples as in estimating the experimental evidence, is all on the side of Christianity. It is not competent for us to sit in judgment on the counsels of the unsearchable God, yet this judgment of our Cana beyond our reach and waywardly expatiating over a region that is purely conjectural is all which can be plausibly alleged in opposition to Christianity. We feel at no loss for a decision as to which of these two should countervail, or rather overmatch the other. 
we have as great a preference for the first over the second as we have for the findings of the Baconian philosophy over the fancies and reveries of the old schoolmen. Such is our general argument in favour of Christianity, and for the purpose of repelling objections of the character that has now been specified, we require no other. 6. Yet there is another way of meeting these objections, and it is Butler's way of it. With us it is enough that they are objections not competent to be made by a creature of such limited faculties and with so narrow a sphere of observation as man. We hold that it is not for him to say that God never would do this one or that other thing alleged of him in Scripture, and that therefore Scripture is not of God. Our reply is that we cannot tell, and on the strength of this argumentum ab ignorantia, We regard such gratuitous and unauthorized assertions on the part of the infidel as of no possible avail against the host of positive evidences which attest the truth of Christianity. Such is our reply, but it is not Butler's. He meets the adversary who says that God never would do this one or that other thing ascribed to him in the Bible by showing that these very things he has actually done, or that what is accepted against in Scripture is exemplified in nature and experience. Or to put it otherwise, what is said of God in the word, and because of which the infidel rejects it as being his word, is done by him in his works, and which yet the infidel continues to regard as his works. We should have been satisfied to dispose of the adversary's objection on the ground of his ignorance, but Butler advances a step further and convicts him of inconsistency. 7. It were well to estimate the precise argumentative force of his peculiar reasoning. Its main office, we hold, then, is to repel objections against Christianity, not to supply or establish any substantive evidence in its favour. Take, for an example, the observation of origin as given by Butler in the introduction to his work. It is to the effect that, quote, he who believes the scripture to have proceeded from him who is the author of nature may well expect to find the same sort of difficulties in it as are found in the constitution of nature, end quote. Now, surely it will not be insisted on as a proof for the divine origin of Scripture that it contains difficulties, for innumerable are the books teeming with these which have been framed by human hands. Yet, though these difficulties in Scripture may form no proof of its divinity, the allegation of like difficulties in nature forms a most complete and conclusive reply to the objection of the deist against Scripture because of its difficulties. For, as Butler says in following up the observation of origin, Quote, he who denies the scripture to have been from God upon account of these difficulties may, for the very same reason, deny the world to have been formed by him. End quote. In how far such analogies may afford a presumption that both scripture and nature, or both the word and the world, have the same author, we shall not inquire, but they are perfectly decisive in the words of Bishop Butler. Quote, At least so far as to answer the objections against the former's being from God, drawn from anything which is analogical or similar to what is in the latter, which is acknowledged to be from him. To repel objections, in fact, is the great service which this analogy has rendered to the cause of revelation, and it is the only service which we seek for at its hands. 8. It appears to us, then, that they overrate the power of analogy who look to it for any very distinct or positive contribution to the Christian argument. There are passages in his work where Butler ascribes this virtue, this argumentative power to it, by which an addition is made to the evidence for revelation, which addition, however, it were extremely difficult to state or to estimate, insomuch that in our controversy with infidels we should willingly forego all claim to any positive accession from this quarter of strength to our cause. When giving in our reasons for the truth and divinity of the Bible, We should speak of the evidence from miracles and the evidence from prophecy and the evidence from the morality of scripture and the evidence from those marks of sincerity and sacredness which abound in it and the evidence of its numerous adaptations to the wants and the weaknesses of sinful humanity. But we should scarcely, by way of increment, and so as to make out a larger summation, adduce the evidence from analogy. And yet we hold it notwithstanding to be a most powerful and efficient auxiliary in this warfare, though its office is mainly, if not altogether, a defensive one, for although it should supply no proof, it may confer a mighty benefit on our cause by repelling all disproof. It may in itself yield no positive evidence, and yet be of most important service by clearing away from all the evidence which is positive the burden of any drawback of deduction that might otherwise lie upon it. It might form no part or ingredient of the probation, and yet remove a bar in the way of the probation, A given proposition might be regarded as liable to one or other of three verdicts. 
proven, not proven, or disproven. Though analogy should furnish no materials on which to construct a plea for the highest of these verdicts, it may nevertheless be of perfect avail for raising up the proposition in question from the lowest of these verdicts to the middle one, for raising it from the state of disproven to at least the state of not proven, and so placing it in what may be termed the midway and neutral state of indifferency or pure scepticism. This is the distinct and definite and with all most valuable service to which analogy, we think, is fully competent, and which service, we further think, Butler hath overtaken and finished. He has raised our question from the depth and the discredit to which infidels would have sunk it, far beneath zero in the scale of evidence. He has at least brought it up to zero, and this is doing an immense deal, even though analogy should utterly fail to place it by ever so little above this, and all further elevations can only be looked for from other quarters of reasoning and contemplation. After that analogy hath done its own proper work, that is, cleared away a whole host of objections, or in other words, left nothing to be neutralized or counteracted, then every new item of evidence tells affirmatively, and it is a clear make-weight on the side of Christian argument. The skeptic who says that there is no reason for believing in Christianity tells us a different thing from the still more daring adversary who says that there are many reasons for disbelieving it. It is with the latter of these two combatants that analogy has properly to do. It does not meet the demand of the first with reasons in proof of Christianity, but it holds parley with the second and thoroughly disposes of his reasons against it. Let it not be imagined that this is a mean or inconsiderable benefit to the Christian argument. Even though it should not supply one atom of evidence for the verdict of credible, it does much, and what is more important, if it fully established the verdict of not incredible. In algebra, a larger summation might be had in two ways, either by placing in the column to be added up some more affirmative quantities, or by the removal therefrom of its negative quantities. It might be questioned whether Butler has done much, or even anything in the way of it, but he has unquestionably done much in the other. Though he may not have contributed a single positive reason himself on the side of Christianity, he is a most valuable auxiliary notwithstanding, if he have cleared away those objections on the neutralizing of which a great part of the force of the positive reasoning may have been otherwise expended. It is thus that, though he should not have added one stone to the superstructure, it may, in virtue of the labor of his hands, have not only become a firmer but a statelier and loftier superstructure than before. 9. His argument is not addressed to atheists. It presupposes a God, but without assuming for him all those attributes which even natural theology would affix to his character. All which it claims at the outset for his great and mysterious being is intelligence and power. It views him as a natural and thence proceeds to regard him as a moral governor also. Not that it proves this latter doctrine, but repels the objections against it, its proper office being not to establish but to vindicate. Butler, in the first part of this treatise, has accomplished this service for the religion of nature, and in its second part accomplishes the like service for the religion of the Bible. End of section 1。section 2 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Of a future life. The prayer. Thou, O God, hast brought life and immortality to light by the gospel. We rejoice that whatever the doubts or whatever the darkness of nature may be on the question of our eternity, there is ample manifestation afforded to us in scripture, both of the endless bliss which is reserved in heaven for the faithful, and of the way that leads to it. We would bless thy name for the information which thou hast given both of the duties and the destinies of man, and it is our prayer that, whenever beset with perplexities of our own, we may take refuge in him who alone hath the words of eternal life. 1. This chapter, which treats of a future life, we hold to be the least satisfactory in the work. This, however, not because the subject of it is beyond the reach of analogy, but because it is so much infected by the obscure metaphysics which obtained in England at the commencement of the last century, which even the reasonings of Clark have not been able to sustain, and which, when disjoined from his talent, as in the pages of Wollaston, and throughout the greater part of the Boyle lectureship, betrays the same sort of mysticism, the same want of clearness and conclusiveness as do the scholastic subtleties of the Middle Ages, 
we allude more particularly to what Butler says of the indivisibility of consciousness and to the confident inference that he would found thereupon as to the simple and so indestructible nature of the agent in which this uncompounded faculty resides, reminding us of certain argumentations which are still to be heard on the immateriality as a ground for believing in the immortality of the human soul. And neither can we admit with him that because we have no positive reason for believing death to be destruction of the living agent, there is the same ground for believing him to be still alive that there is for our natural faith in the continuance of anything. If this consideration hold true, then instead of its yielding but a dim or slender probability, it presents us with an absolute demonstration. Not as if Butler thought of analogy that it constitutes this argument, but he evidently thinks that it hands us over to it. We think that it hands us over to sounder and better arguments than this, while of itself it should claim no higher than the negative power which we have contended for, the power of placing the question of our soul's immortality in that negative and neutral position where it is freed of all the presumptions against it, but where the presumptions for it have yet to be sought for from other quarters. Or, in other words, where, though no longer disproved, it still remains an unproved thing. It is not enough to say that the entire self survives the loss of a limb. The conclusion is that therefore it may survive the loss or separation of the whole body, very different truly from the conclusion which is more than hinted at in this chapter, that the soul must so survive it. In all instances which are alleged here of mutilation or destruction, we have the remaining sensible proof for the continuance of the living powers. In the grand or final destruction of the whole body, we have no such proof and this must be supplied from another source than from the analogy itself, which has demonstrated but the posse, but not the esse, of the soul's immortality. It has not supplied the proof, but only removed every bar in the way of it. It has not, at least to any sensible or calculable extent, mounted the question upward on the scale of evidence, but it has done a great deal if, raising it from lower depths, it shall have placed it at the bottom of the scale. For any further ascent above this, it must stand indebted to other and positive considerations, such as the power and aspirations of the mind, and its capacity for indefinitely higher enjoyments than any it meets with in this world, but most of all the moral argument, or that grounded on the conscience of man, which points to a coming judgment and coming immortality for a righteous settlement of all these innumerable questions of constant occurrence in our present state, whether of unavenged sin against God, or of unredressed injustice between man and man, which, if left without equitable adjustment in a future state, would cause that our world should be not only a deep moral enigma never to be solved, but a scene of perfect moral anarchy and confusion, never either to be reformed or reckoned with. 2. And yet the analogies of this chapter serve all the purposes of that argument which legitimately and properly belongs to them. Let but the metaphysical reasoning for the indivisibility of consciousness and so for the continuance of the human soul on which it is here attempted to build up a positive consideration in favour of the doctrine of immortality, let these be discarded. Let it further be held as the main function of analogy not to supply the proofs but to repel the disproofs. And then nothing can be imagined more effective and more beautiful than the illustrations of this otherwise least interesting and least successful of all Butler's demonstrations. The transmutations, which take place in the state of other animals, as birds and insects, and yet with the subsistence of the living principle in each of the stages, and most of all the mutilations which the human body undergoes, and yet without the destruction of the living powers, these all abundantly warrant the conclusion not that the soul must, but that the soul may survive the entire dissolution of that material framework wherewith it is now encompassed. They make the doctrine probable, in the sense that they make it provable, or, in other words, that they lay it clear and open for being proved, which is truly a different thing from the positive work of proving it, whether in part or in whole. These analogies have achieved a useful service if they have brought up the doctrine to that point of neutrality at which any further evidence, however small, may affirmatively tell upon it, and that on evidence contributed from other quarters than from analogy itself. 3. In this view of it, we feel relieved from all the difficulty which attaches to the consideration that, as far as there is positive weight in those reasonings of Butler, they serve to establish not the immortality of men only, but also of the inferior animals. 
and so they would if they could lay claim to a weight that is positive. The vital principle in a beast survives the loss of a limb in as great vigor and entireness as that of a man does. Nay, many are the inferior creatures whose life remains in them after far severer mutilations or more frightful dislocation and derangement of the parts than man could undergo, and yet continue alive. Nay, if the worshippers of this argument will persist in ascribing to it an affirmative value, they might proceed on the strength of it to demonstrate the immortality of the vegetable life in plants as well as of the animal life in man, and throughout all the species beneath him. For there are kinds of wood which might be specified where the vegetative power has been known to survive all the processes of the right shop, insomuch that, after having been subjected to the treatment of the saw and the plane and the hatchet, and then inserted as a stake or piece of paling in the ground, it has actually broken out into foliage, and thus given evidence that the vital or vegetative principle of growth has been so far indestructible. It were a somewhat extravagant conclusion from such phenomena that plants, or rather, that what constituted the vitality of plants must be an indestructible or an undying principle. It is an extravagance, however, not at all chargeable on those who do not seek to found on the analogical argument so much as one atom of affirmative probability for the immortality either of men or animals or vegetables, but willingly at the same time concede to analogy the power of raising all the three from depths which are beneath to the same dead level of the perfectly neutral and unknown, thus warranting the like assertion in regard to each class of these organic creatures, or rather of the life which is within them. Not that it must, but that, for aught we know, it may be immortal. This is the whole length to which we should carry the inference from analogy, with the full conviction at the same time of high probabilities for the immortality of man, founded, however, not on that which is common to him with the others, but on that which is peculiar and which signalizes him from or above the others, as the conscience which is his exclusively, and those indefinite powers and aspirations which are his exclusively. The analogical argument places all these three, then, on the same level in regard to the possibility of their being immortal. The probabilities, however, of this high destination can only be claimed by man. We should hold it the most unphilosophical temerity to affirm so much as the slightest atom of evidence for the immortality either of beasts or of plants, and that notwithstanding the kindred phenomena which they exhibit to those of the human framework yet we deem it to be neither temerity nor extravagance, but in the very spirit of the true philosophic modesty to affirm on the strength of those phenomena that for aught we know they may be immortal. The affirmation this not of a positive knowledge, but of conscious ignorance. 4. And in like manner we do not see that there is a positive incompatibility between the doctrine of the soul's immortality and the system of atheism. In our estimation, it would then rank among the propositions of the terra incognita. We could allege no reason for the denial, but most assuredly as little for the assertion of this immortality. It is the doctrine of a god, and that alone, which yields for the doctrine of man's immortality all the positive evidence that it can rightfully pretend to. It is because we think that God will not leave either the vices or the virtues of men without such a reckoning and such a recompense as are far from being fully realized in this world, and it is because we think that he would not have endowed man with such boundless conceptions and desires and such expansive faculties unless he meant to provide him with a larger and more enduring theater in which he might expatiate. It is on these considerations, each of them presupposing a God, that we reason onward to the conclusion of a future state of existence, both for repairing the inequalities and supplementing the deficiencies of the present. End of section 2 Section 3 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain of the government of God by rewards and punishments, and particularly of the latter. The Prayer Thou, O God, art unchangeable, and there is a steadfastness of principle which reigns throughout all thine administration. Thou canst not look upon evil with complacency, neither can sin be dealt with under thy holy and inflexible government without a ransom or without an expiation. May we count it no light matter that we have broken the law of God, and that the first and greatest of its commandments, even the supreme love of himself, has been hourly and habitually violated. 
May we therefore feel our need of a saviour and our need of a sanctifier, and submit ourselves to the authority of that message which came to our world, charged with the overtures of a world's reconciliation. 5. Though we should not hold the analogies of this chapter to be even presumptive reasons for a future state of rewards and punishments, they are all sufficient for repelling the objections against it. They might supply no grounds of evidence, yet effectually cut away all grounds of opposition. Should it be alleged from the benevolence of God that he would not only confer happiness on his family below, but absolutely secure it, so as to place it beyond the reach of accident and hazard, and more especially that he would not make this happiness dependent on aught so precarious as the conduct of creatures so frail and capricious as we. This is conclusively met by the facts and observations of what is going on around us. Let us devise what explanations we may for the rationale of such a procedure. It is the actual procedure of the Almighty in his government of our present world. Both the happiness and misery of man are, in many instances, placed at his own disposal and in his own power, and it is quite a piece with this that his state, whether of enjoyment or of wretchedness in the life that is to come, should be the result of his character and doings in the life that now is. Man often knows beforehand that such a good or such an evil will be the consequence of his present actions, so that if apprised of a state of existence beyond death, where he will be happy or miserable, according to the life which he leads in this world, there is nothing to object against such a regimen which might not be objected against the regimen of which, in our present state, we have countless exemplifications. This consideration may not afford a sufficient basis on which to affirm the doctrine of future rewards and punishments, but it is complete as a defense against the infidelity which would deny them. 6. Such an economy, then, that is, of actions followed up by foreseen pleasures and pains, and which are therefore fitted to induce one line of conduct and deter from another, is, to all intents and purposes, a government, making it not unlikely that there may be a similar, though a more extended government, and by which, consequent on our actions here, there are rewards or punishments hereafter. We do not say that the one which is seen makes the other which is still unseen positively credible, but the analogy between them warrants at least the more limited and juster inference of its being not incredible, or in Butler's own language, quote, the whole present course of things most fully shows that there is nothing incredible in the general doctrine of religion as far as the notion of rewarding and punishing is concerned, end quote. 7. And as they are the punishments rather than the rewards which are more liable to be accepted against, he points out certain striking analogies between the actual punishments of this life and the alleged punishments of another, which, whether they have in them any of the virtue of proofs or not, are at least of full effect in clearing away a whole host of objections. For example, the actions which are thus visited are generally committed for the sake of a present tempting gratification, as when intemperance is followed up by disease, and these eventual pains or chastisements are often far greater than the immediate enjoyment, as when the disgrace of a whole lifetime results from the indulgence, which lasts but for a moment, of some ungovernable passion, and frequently a long delay intervenes between the commission and its penalty, as when the secret fraud or profligacy, it may be of many years back, at length breaks out, to the consequent ruin of the perpetrator, either in character or circumstances. And when these natural punishments do come, it is often with an astounding suddenness, and when they are altogether unlooked for, and the sufferers may have very far from a clear evidence or expectation beforehand of what is to follow. And yet their want of this clear and confident anticipation, nay, the delusive hope, perhaps even the probability that after all they may escape the calamity in question, might not prevent the sure and sore fulfilment of it. In these various ways and with these various accompaniments, may the imprudence, or as is often thought the natural and excusable heedlessness of one stage of life, be followed up by the irretrievable want or wretchedness of its future stages, so as to realize in living and actual experience the very things which are most readily seized upon by infidels and protested against as the intolerable severities of the religious system. The paragraph of this chapter where the enumeration of these resemblances is given presents us with one of the finest triumphs of the analogical argument and in which its power as a weapon of defense appears to great advantage, cutting down as with a scythe 
a whole army of those objections which are most frequent in the mouths of adversaries, being not only the most plausible in themselves, but the most formidable in point of effect, from a certain tone of generous denunciation against all arbitrary and tyrannic rule in which they are propounded and so as to associate the semblance of a protesting and moral indignancy with the infidel cause. 8. They who say to themselves peace when there is no peace, and cherish a delusive security, as if in the hands of an indulgent God who will not bear too hard upon them, but make allowance for the frailty of nature and the force of external temptations, such as these would do well to ponder the reasonings of this chapter. If they do not make out a positive demonstration on the side of religion, they at least make out the decisive overthrow of aught like a positive demonstration on the side of atheism. They do not of themselves constitute the argument by which to uphold the systems of natural theology or of the Christian revelation, but they level to the ground many of the strongest and likeliest defenses which the enemies of religion have to rear in opposition to the argument. 9. In the third paragraph of this chapter, Butler makes a fine display of true philosophic modesty. He undertakes no absolute defense of God's administration, but proposes a series of conjectures, which, like the queries of Sir Isaac Newton, express rather the confessions of ignorance than any disposition to press into mysteries which are yet unknown to us. The object of this treatise, in fact, does not require that there shall be any positive solution of existing appearances, for... He is not holding parley with atheists, but supposes his adversary in the argument to believe a god, and of course to acquiesce in all that is, as consistent with the plans of his wisdom and the perfections of his moral character. So that all which he undertakes to show is that the things accepted against in any given doctrine of theology are the very things which may also be detected in the actual phenomena of nature or of providence. This may not furnish any valid proof on his own side of the question, but at least enables him to do away what might otherwise have stood as a valid objection on the other side of the question. Our antagonists can no longer persist in urging against the schemes either of natural or revealed theology what they find to be revealed in that part of the divine scheme which is before their eyes. Analogy may have done nothing yet to substantiate either natural or revealed theology, It may yet have supplied no proof, but it has done much if it have cleared away all disproof, and so left both theologies in a free state for being advantaged by all the appropriate evidences which might be brought forward to sustain them. End of section 3section 4 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Moral Government of God The Prayer Thou sittest, O God, on a throne of judgment, whence thine eyes do behold and thine eyelids do try the children of men. Give us to feel the control of thine omniscient eye, and on comparing the sacredness of thy character with the sinfulness of ours, may we be visited with a sense of guilt and of danger, and gladly betake ourselves to the refuge set before us in the gospel. May we at length be constrained to yield a thankful acquiescence in the overtures of the New Testament, that with Jesus Christ, as the Lord our righteousness and the Lord our strength, we may walk before thee without fear, yet walk before thee in holy and new obedience all the days of our lives. 10. The subject of the present chapter is as distinct from that of the former as the generic idea of a government is distinct from the more particular idea of it as possessed of a certain character or as being of a certain kind and species. If certain actions are followed up by pleasure and others by pain, and these are known beforehand so that the agent can foresee the consequence of his doings, even as he would have done if under a proclaimed law which told at the same time of its own rewards and its own penalties. These are enough of themselves to constitute a government, having its regulations which are known and its sanctions which are executed. So much for government in the general. But should it be found among these general phenomena that those actions which are righteous were followed up by pleasure and those actions which are wicked were followed up by pain, this would present us with a moral government enveloped, as it were, in the general and natural and it is to the manifestations of such a government in the course and constitution of nature that the author now addresses his observations. 11. 
As in the former chapter, so here too he discovers the same cautious reverence for things unknown, and more especially when they relate to the character and ways of God, of whom we had already said that we are apt to make greatly too free in our speculations. He obviously lays discountenance on that theory which would represent benevolence as the alone attribute of the Godhead, and that all the other attributes are but phases or modifications of this, an imagination which has given rise to much of our meagre and much of our heretical theology. But without stopping to consider this dogma, and without pronouncing either for or against it, he rightly holds it enough for his argument that God does manifest himself in this world as a righteous governor, a master over servants, as well as the parent of a family, and that, therefore, he may so manifest himself in the world which is to come. But it is to be observed that the considerations in which he here deals are such as not merely serve to annul objections, but to make out a substantive proof in favour of his doctrine, and therefore we venture to affirm that every intelligent reader will feel as if in this part of his work he had firmer hold of a positive argument than generally throughout the volume. The explanation of this seems to be that the things which are here alleged of present observation warrant a much larger conclusion than that as they take place in this world, so they may take place in the next, a conclusion sufficient of itself to neutralize all reasons of disbelief. But the truth is, they are such things as make out the strong probability of God being a moral governor here, and hence the probability, alike strong, that he will not renounce this character in another state, but sustain there the part of a moral governor also. It is on the footing of this intermediate term in the reasoning that the argument gathers into a strength and an affirmative value beyond what we are sensible of in the other departments of this treatise. Everywhere do the analogies quoted by our author fulfill their own definite and appropriate function, which is to repel objections. But here, and for the reason, we apprehend, which has now been proposed, they seem to shoot ahead of all the others, and supply weighty proofs rather than slender presumptions, to perform a higher service than we generally seek or look for at their hands. 12. The express purpose, indeed, of this chapter is to prove in how far a moral government has been already and actually established, and so as to found on its present appearances and first beginnings here the anticipation of its larger developments hereafter. In the prosecution of this task he takes full advantage of all the existing phenomena that bear upon the question, and our own natural sense of justice, the undoubted consequences of prudence and imprudence, the rewards and punishments either of a propriety on the one hand or of its violation on the other, the chastisements which fall on vice as being hurtful to society, the natural pleasures of virtue and pains of vice, as such and in themselves, apart from their effects either of good or evil to the commonwealth, the regard so far borne to virtue by men, and the detestation so far of its opposite, that the former is on the whole followed up by the esteem of society, and the latter by its contempt and disapproval. These all serve to indicate a moral government, being so many specimens before our eyes of the manner in which he deals with the righteous and the wicked respectively, and so as to reward the one by certain present advantages and pleasures, and to punish the other by certain present damages and discomforts, both inwardly and outwardly. It is true that there are certain cross or adverse phenomena which seem to make against this argument, but which, in the hands of our author, and by the help of his sound discrimination, are most effectually disposed of. As when it is said that there is a pleasure in the indulgence of certain vicious passions, as indeed there must be in every indulgence, and our author replies that this is owing to the passion itself, and not to what is vicious in it. For while the passion must necessarily by its gratification yield pleasure, the vice that is in it may notwithstanding, and simply as vice, yield pain, being followed up by self-dissatisfaction from within, and disgrace from without. There is another wise and important distinction made by him, and by which he gets quit of many apparent exceptions to the rule for which he argues of a moral government in this life. These are the instances of vicious actions being sometimes rewarded, yet never, he well replies, because they are vicious, but though they are vicious. And again, virtuous actions are sometimes punished, yet never as virtuous, or never because virtuous, but though virtuous. It is thus that all contradictory appearances are put out of the way, but it is when reasoning on the tendencies of things, and on what the full and final result would be if either a universal virtue or universal vice was to prevail in the world, 
that the advocates for its being under a moral regimen are placed on their highest vantage ground. In the chapter before us, Butler takes the full benefit of this consideration and shows most effectively that, in like manner, as by dint of innate tendency and force of reason, men have the superiority over brutes, notwithstanding the greater strength in many instances of the latter, so by dint of the same innate tendency and force in virtue, the righteous of our species will come in fair circumstances, that is, in a state of union and mutual understanding, to bear the rule or maintain the just and wholesome ascendant over general society. Now, these considerations have in them a great weight of positive argument on the side of a moral government, and so of a moral governor, insomuch that, though our attention at the time were not at all directed to the future, but confined to present appearances, we should thence alone infer a strong probability for a reigning and righteous God, but when once we have attained to this, we come into possession of a strong affirmative evidence, the strongest within the reach of unassisted nature, for virtue being rewarded and vice being punished in another world, and hence perhaps the reason why, in this passage of the demonstration, there seems a greater ascent above the level of mere neutrality, or but the power of countervailing objections, than in any other part of the treatise. And yet the author himself recognizes, and nowhere more than in this portion of his work, a distinctness between the proper arguments for religion and his own argument from analogy, the peculiar and chief function of which is not to supply the proofs for, but to repel the disproofs against it. He tells us that, quote, suppositions are not to be looked on as true, because not incredible, end quote. Now it is for the other argument to satisfy us that religion is true, and more strictly for the analogical to satisfy us that it is not incredible. And again he admits that, quote, It is not the purpose of this chapter, nor of this treatise, properly to prove God's perfect moral government over the world, or the truth of religion, but to observe what there is in the constitution and course of nature to confirm the proper proof of it, supposed to be known, end quote though the office of analogy in our estimation is not so much to confirm as to defend. Our inestimable author expresses very nearly the same notion when he speaks of the proof of a future state of retribution resting upon the usual known arguments for it, which he thinks plainly unanswerable, and would be so, though there were no additional confirmation of them from the things above insisted upon. It is true, he adds, quote, but these things are a very strong confirmation of them, end quote, and yet he distinguishes these from what he calls, quote, the proper proof of religion, end quote, and acknowledges of his own special argument that while it gives just ground to hope and to fear that virtue and vice may be rewarded and punished in a higher degree hereafter, this alone is not sufficient ground to think that they actually will be so rewarded and punished. We should hold it enough to claim for analogy the power of demonstrating that religion may be true, leaving it to the other arguments to prove that it actually is true. But it is comfortable to think that, however different the impressions may be of its precise argumentative amount and value, it, at least to the former of these two achievements, or the demonstration of what may be, is fully and altogether competent. End of section 4 Section 5 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of a state of probation as implying trials, difficulties, and danger. The Prayer. Thou art throned in mystery, O God. It is but a part of thy ways that we are admitted to behold, but the whole extent of thy wondrous plan and the processes, whether of creation or of providence, who can comprehend? Give us to wait with patience those further evolutions, in virtue of which what we see not now we shall see afterward, and meanwhile let us cultivate that blessed charity whereof thou hast said that it is greater than all faith and than all knowledge. We feel assured that though clouds and darkness are round about thee, there is wisdom in all thy ways, there is kindness in all thy visitations. 13. It might be, and often is indeed, made an objection to the religious system that our way to the everlasting blessedness, which it proposes, should be beset with so many lures which tempt us aside from the prosecution of it, and, on the other hand, that so many hardships and difficulties should be attendant on our steadfast perseverance in that way. The thing complained of is that our great and ultimate good should have been made of such difficult attainment 
insomuch that the frail powers of humanity, either for the achievement of what is good or the resistance of what is evil, are so greatly overtasked as in the great majority of instances to be overborne. Why, it may be asked, is the realization of our true and eternal happiness made so very operose as to be well-nigh impracticable? And would it not have been in better keeping with the character of a God of love had there been fewer obstructions on our road to heaven or the bliss of our coming immortality been reached by an easier and more accessible path? It is spoken of as an intolerable grievance that we should be punished for what is natural and only rewarded for an obedience which, save in the cases of a select and privileged few, is greatly beyond the strength of nature. 14. Now, in this chapter, we are presented with a complete and conclusive analogy, which, if it do not establish the reality of our religious trial, at least serves to vindicate it against the exceptions which we have just enumerated. Whatever doubt we may stand in regarding those doctrines which respect the future and the unseen, there can be no quarreling with present and actually observed facts. If the doctrine be that the way to our eternal good is a way of labor and self-denial, it is in perfect analogy with the fact that this is the way to our temporal good also. It is quite palpable that often many toils must be undergone and many temptations resisted ere we can secure the most highly prized advantages of the life that now is, and the conclusion is not that similar toils and temptations must, but that they may be the precursors and the preparatives of our happiness in another state of being. In both cases, a future and greater good is sacrificed to present ease or present gratification. If religion tells us that men, by the indulgence of their sloth or their passions, often forfeit the good of their eternity, experience tells us that in the very same way men do often forfeit the wealth and health of a whole lifetime. In this respect, the season of youth stands related to the seasons of manhood or old age, very much according to the way in which we are told that the acts or habits of man on this side of death stand related to his state, whether in respecting of suffering or enjoyment, on the other side of death. In both we behold the same recklessness, the same defiance to consequences, and the same misrule of headstrong or overmastering appetites, and that, too, in the face of all hazards and apprehensions, whether for time or for eternity, whether of disgrace and poverty in this world, or of never-ending wretchedness in the next. If because of these things we must give up the God of religion, we should give up the God of nature also. If we persist in our objection notwithstanding these analogies, then should we conclude either that we are under the regimen of an unrighteous deity, or that there is no deity at all? And there are certain aggravations in our lot which furnish the enemies of religion with other topics of invective against it, but which are similarly matched by what takes place under our own observation, so that the futurities of which we are told beyond the day of human life are analogous to facts and fulfilments within it of which we have the daily experience. That men, for example, should be in worse circumstances for the preparations of another world by the neglect of parents or a wrong education or in any way by the influence and example of others, thus suffering for a wickedness not originally their own. This is quite of a piece with the manner in which the interests of a more advanced stage in our journey here are affected not merely by our own misconduct, but by the misconduct towards us of relatives or associates during its earlier stages. And thus it is, too, that, as continued indulgence, whether in idleness or pleasure, is constantly adding to the difficulties which attend our prosecution of a right course of education for eternity, the very same thing takes place regarding our interests in time, insomuch that the dissipations, nay, even but the delays of slothfulness and the love of ease persisted in for a few years of early life, might bring on such an utter incapacity for the restraints of labor or business as might ruin one's temporal prospects, and subject him to degradation and want throughout the whole of his existence in this world as penalties for the mismanagement of his younger days. 15. Butler, in one brief paragraph in this chapter, exceeds his usual aim and limit of his argument and aspires to an absolute vindication of the ways of God. He tells us that in regard to religion there is no more required of men than what they are well able to do and well able to go through. We fear that he here makes the first, though not the only, exhibition which occurs in the work of his meagre and moderate theology. There seems no adequate view in this passage of man's total inability for what is spiritually and acceptably good. 
For, by the very analogy which he institutes, the doctrine of any special help to that obedience which qualifies for heaven is kept out of sight. We are represented as fit for the work of religion in the same way that we are fit, by a moderate degree of care, for managing our temporal affairs with tolerable prudence. There is no account made here of that peculiar helplessness which obtains in the matters of religion, and that does not obtain in the matters of ordinary prudence, yet a helplessness which forms no excuse, lying, as it does, in the resolute and, by man himself, unconquerable aversion of his will to God and godliness. There is nothing in this to break the analogies on which to found the negative vindication that forms the great and undoubted achievement of this volume, and with which, perhaps, it were well if both its author and its readers would agree to be satisfied. The analogy lies here, that if a man wills to obtain prosperity in this life, he may, if observant of the rules which experience and wisdom prescribe, in general make it good, and if he will to attain to blessedness in the next life, he shall, if observant of what religion prescribes, and in conformity with the declaration that he who seeketh findeth, he shall most certainly make it good. It is true that in the latter and larger case the condition is universally a-wanting, for man in his natural state has no relish and no will for that holiness without which he cannot see God. But to meet this peculiar helplessness there has been provided a peculiar remedy, for God makes a people willing in the day of his power, and gives his Holy Spirit to them who ask it, so as to give forth not an analogous and neutral, but a special and that a positive demonstration of the divine goodness. It had been well if in this matter Bishop Butler had attempted to carry the analogy no farther than it will go. Sound as his general views were on what might be termed the philosophy of religion, this formed no security against the errors of a lax and superficial creed on certain of its specific doctrines, any more than the comprehensive philosophy of Lord Bacon formed a safeguard against the crudities into which he fell when he entered in detail on the lessons of physical science. 16. Bating the exception that we have now made, we deem this chapter to be one of the most successful in the volume, as holding forth a perfect specimen of analogy between what we observe of the present and what we are told of the future life, in that the good things of both are offered, not to our acceptance, but to our acquisition, and this an acquisition which can only be made out at the expense of great painstaking and self-denial. He undertakes not to say why this is, but acquiesces in the finding that so it is in the spirit of that just and characteristic philosophy which refrains from speculating further on the constitution of nature till it shall know the whole or much more of the case, and resting satisfied with it as a sufficient basis for its argument that this constitution is as it is. 17. Before proceeding further, there is one general exception, not against the reasonings of this chapter only, but against the reasonings of the whole volume, which we should like to dispose of. It is grounded on the consideration of the infinitely larger interests of the future than of the present state of being. The analogy might be admitted as complete in kind between the hardship of a ruined fortune in this world because of misconduct or neglect, and the hardship from the same cause of a ruined eternity. But along with this, there might be the lurking imagination of a failure in the analogy because of the tremendous difference between these two hardships in point of degree, the one or smaller of the two, and of which there is no questioning the reality, because palpably acted before our eyes, may be tolerated as somehow consistent with the moral perfections of God, while the other, because incomparably the larger, and which we do not yet see, but are only told of, may be resented and resisted as an incredible outrage on all equity and goodness. Or, while the one might pass, the other might be regarded as a serious impeachment on the character of the deity. 18. Now to meet this alleged difficulty, let it first be observed that the objection thus conjured up involves in it a wrong moral principle. If there indeed be injustice in the larger dispensation, then in the analogous smaller there must be injustice also, and he that is unfaithful in the least is unfaithful also in much, so that we must either give up the character, and with this perhaps the being of God, or admit that there is not the reality but only at worst the semblance of injustice in both. And the truth is that they who thus reason upon degrees and would acquiesce in the smaller while they vehemently exclaim against the larger iniquity, are unconsciously running themselves into inconsistence and supplying their adversaries with the means of an ample vindication, once that there is a toleration for unrighteousness or severity in the littles of the divine government, 
as if this could be compensated by its beneficence and justice on the larger scale of eternity, or among the higher orders of creation, then all the degradation and distress to which inferior creatures of humbler faculties and ephemeral duration are subjected might be allowed to pass, if only made up for by the gifts and the felicities which are heaped on the noble creature man, as if the richness of his liberality in matters of higher concern, and to beings of higher consideration, conferred a license for all lesser acts of caprice or cruelty in things of inferior moment. But to prove how inapplicable this whole reasoning about degrees is to the affairs of an universal administration in the hands of the infinite and unsearchable God, it should be recollected that if there be hardship in the destruction of a reptile, and this can be compensated by his exuberant and overpassing goodness to man, then let there be hardship in the destruction of a world and of all who live in it, and there is room too for this being compensated in that amplitude of innumerable worlds to which our own is but an atom on the high field of immensity, and which are peopled, for aught we know, by beings of a far more exalted order than ourselves. It is altogether vain to reason of degrees amidst the exhaustless varieties of a universe that is boundless, when in one direction there is an infinitude ever rising and expanding, and in the other a microscopic descent to regions of still deeper mystery. If injustice is at all to be tolerated, if it may be acquiesced in among the lower places, as it were, of creation, then may it be carried indefinitely higher, and still above and beyond would there be room for compensation in wider and loftier theatres for the manifestation and exercise of all those perfections, whether of love or of righteousness, which enter into the nature of the Godhead. But far the likelier solution is that if there be the semblance of injustice in the divine government anywhere, it is but a semblance, and that on the part of God there is real injustice nowhere. We have access to but a little part of his ways, and meanwhile it should be enough for at least the silencing of objections that we have the analogy of what is seen to what both the natural and the Christian theology tell us of the unseen, satisfied to wait for the final disclosure when it will be found of God that he has done all things well and that there is no unrighteousness in him. End of section 5《セクション6 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Of a state of probation as intended for moral discipline and improvement。The Prayer。Thou, O God, hast placed us in a world that is full of danger and full of tribulation, but we rejoice that there is a power greater than the world upon our side, that the faith which overcometh all things hath the promise of the Spirit, of whom thou hast said, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. May we watch for this Spirit with all perseverance, that, directed by its guidance and animated by its strength, we may be borne off more than conquerors from every scene of duty and of difficulty through him who loved us. 19. The present chapter stands in the same relation to the one preceding it, which that on the moral does, to the natural government of God. It still treats of probation, but of probation with a particular end, even that of schooling men in the practice, and so as to confirm them in the habits of virtue. The philosophic caution of the outset, and then the description given by him of the education of habits, are alike characteristic of the modesty and the observant sagacity of Butler. A just discernment of all that is within the sphere of competent knowledge, and a disinclination to speculate, far less to dogmatize, on all which is without that sphere, are fruits of the same right inductive spirit, and are both of them the constituents of true science. The evils that, he remarks, would ensue were man introduced all at once with mature faculties into a mature state of life, instead of having to undergo a slow process of education, afford not a positive solution, but somewhat like a glimpse of probability and promise towards a full understanding at length of the imperfections of our present state. But on this too he only touches and wisely forbears to theorize. 20. It seems a bold analogy to institute between the waste of so many vegetable seeds destroyed in vast numbers before they have attained or fulfilled the proper end of their creation, and the ruin of so many moral agents, the great majority of whom have hitherto and throughout the successive generations of the world apparently fallen short of that blissful immortality for which the theatre of our present life is fitted to discipline and prepare them. 
This were indeed an insufficient basis on which to found any affirmative conclusion, though it is not too much to say that the one phenomenon is as unaccountable as the other, which is enough for the purposes of our argument, that is not designed and does not pretend to account for the, quote, whole end and the whole occasion of mankind being placed in such a state as the present, end quote. The main object of the reasoning here, and indeed of the volume at large, is not to demonstrate what is, but what may be, the possible rather than the actual, and so as to prepare the subject in question for the full benefit of those other reasonings which serve to build it up under the article of a creed. The two things thus brought into comparison, however like in kind, are widely different in degree, and ere the analogy between them can be sustained, the principle which we have just tried to expound in section 18 must not only be understood, but acquiesced in. 21. We do not understand that under the economy of grace, the law of habit has been repealed, or any other indeed of those laws of our mental nature on which Butler proceeds in the reasonings of this chapter. Whatever the peculiar aids and expedients of the gospel might be for the perfecting of our meetness for heaven, they supersede not the efficacy of that process under which, by reason of use, the senses are exercised to discern between good and evil. Hebrews 5 verse 14. And, we may add too, the powers are either enfeebled or strengthened according as we yield to the temptations of the one or fulfill the lessons of the other. But though there might be nothing in this chapter which is distinctly or articulately in conflict with revealed truth, yet the impression which on the whole it is fitted to give is not altogether in keeping with it. It seems in fact to represent the matter, so as if man could at his own pleasure turn himself from the path of degeneracy, and gradually, or by little and little, through the strengthening influence of habit, accomplish his own recovery. And, as if in counterpart to this, the author gives an ideal representation of the manner in which man has been brought into a state of moral ruin, that is, by a slight deflection at the first and a gently declining path from one state of corruption to another afterwards. Now one cannot help being struck with a palpable incongruousness or want of harmony between this hypothetical fall of Bishop Butler and the historical fall of Scripture, which is there said to have taken place per saltum, or with all the suddenness of a catastrophe, and so as to have effected an instant transition from a relationship of peace and favor to a relationship of enmity with God. But let us only consider the effect of a first sin, and it will be found that the account in the Bible has not only more of authority on its side, but is really in better accordance both with the nature of the case itself and with the nature of man. Certain it is that in civil government a single offence might not only put the transgressor into full hostility with the law, but incur for him an instant disruption from all the fellowships of creditable society, just as the single offence of Adam both constituted him at once an outlaw and expelled him from the high and heavenly companionship of paradise. And the effect was not more instantaneous upon his state than upon his character, for the love of God would, under the misgivings of conscious guilt, give place to a sentiment of dread and alienation, nay of hatred to him who must now be regarded as an enemy, or in the light of an offended sovereign. It is thus that an instant moral revolution behooved to take place, and as it was by a single act that man passed into a state of ruin, so it is by a single act that he passes into a state of recovery and reconciliation. In the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit he died, but in the day or on the moment of his believing in the Son of God, he passes back again from death unto life. This is the turning point of his salvation, and by which there is effected not only the instant translation of him into a new hope, but also into a new heart, and so a new character. A newborn love springs up with a newborn confidence, though we doubt not that in the history of this now regenerated creature, the law of habit, as well as all the other unrepealed laws of humanity, will still continue to find their full exemplification. The tenet of justification by faith is at antipodes with the idea of our virtue here being the adequate price, but not with the idea of its being the indispensable preparation for our eternity hereafter. Under the economy of grace, heaven is conceived essentially to lie in character, to be, in fact, but the expansion, the full-grown development of our present charity, our present piety, our present holiness. There is nothing surely in the doctrine and philosophy of habit counter to that system which represents it as the great business of those who have received the promises of the gospel to perfect their holiness, which tells us that what a man soweth, that shall he also reap 
which speaks on the one hand of the path of the just, as if his rudimental virtue here were to his perfected virtue hereafter what the dawn of morn is to the shining of the meridian day, and which speaks on the other hand of the wicked being filled with the fruit of their own ways, which, in a word, represents the kingdom of heaven as begun on earth, and at last closes its description of the relation between time and eternity with these impressive words, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Nor yet is there aught in the doctrine of the Spirit's agency which conflicts with what is here said of certain natural principles in the constitution of man, and of the share which they have in the growth and establishment of human virtue. The agency of the Spirit is completely reconcilable with all those successions in the phenomena of our nature, which have ever met the observation or been at all reasoned upon by philosophers. The supernatural is affected without violence or derangement to the harmonies of the natural. A light and power are given, yet all the processes of mind, so far as they are discoverable by us, move in their wanted order, and if the strengthening and confirming power of habit be one of these processes, then may we rest assured that after the revelation of a spiritual influence, it still remains a fit subject for all the discrimination and argument which the sound and sagacious butler has bestowed on it. 22. The oversight of Butler, in that he lays down a hypothetical which quadrates so little with the historical fall, is that he has not at all adverted to the essential moral element which attaches to a first sin. By the first transgression there is not merely a commencement made on a gently declining path, but there is a sudden transition effected into a new state of relationship with God. On the moment of transgression we become rebels to God, a sense of guilt enters the heart, and along with it the distrust, the alienation, the fears of guilt. We can no longer go freely forth to him in willing and affectionate obedience, and a sudden moral disruption takes place between us and God. The narrative in the book of Genesis will be found, we are persuaded, far more accordant with the real nature of the human constitution, so that, instead of that gradual and progressive descent which Bishop Butler imagines, there is in fact a passage, per asaltum, from a state of innocence to that opposite state in which man feels himself deserted by the only principle that can give life or value to his obedience, and landed in a condemnation which by himself is irrevocable. 23. But it is chiefly in his description of the reverse movement that our author discovers what I would call the meagerness of his Christianity. In making recovery from an undone state, he seems to regard nothing more as necessary than a strenuous and sustained endeavour on the part of man to acquire new habits and shake off the tyranny of old ones. He forgets that a breach must be removed, that the sense of guilt must be taken away, that a reconciliation must be effected, and that it is only in the confidence of such reconciliation that man can go forth again with alacrity and vigour in the services of a new obedience. What he says of the vast majority finding the world to be a school of vice rather than of virtue forms a most impressive commentary on the insufficiency of all natural motives and natural expedients for the world's regeneration. Nothing else, let us be assured, save the offered pardon of the gospel, possesses the charm and the efficacy of awakening us again to the virtue from which we had departed. And it is only by the tidings of a sacrifice and the promises of a spirit falling with acceptance on the hearts of our outcast species that man will return unto God, or that, in the universal reign of righteousness and truth, the cross of Christ will behold the consummation of its triumphs. End of section 6《Section 6》《Section 7 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers》this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the opinion of necessity considered as influencing practice. The prayer. Thou reignest supreme, O God, in the moral as well as in the material universe. Thou turnest the hearts of men whithersoever thou wilt. Thy command reaches to the processes of the living as well as to those of the inanimate creation. And while there is a countless diversity of operations, it is God who worketh all in all. We would comfort ourselves with the thought that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, and we are persuaded that when the mystery of God is finished, it will be found thou hast done all things well, and that their final consummation is worthy of thy perfect goodness and thy perfect intelligence. 24. 
It is obvious from this chapter that Butler partook with almost all the English theologians of his age in that religious horror so often felt and expressed by them against the doctrine of necessity. And certain it is that in the minds of its advocates this tenant stood very generally associated at that time both with infidelity in religion and with an utter subversion of the first principles, nay, of the very being and substance of morality. It was more particularly imagined that it annulled the distinction between virtue and vice and did away with man's responsibility. Leibniz, however, though a necessitarian, retained the orthodoxy notwithstanding both of his Christian and ethical principles, and we are persuaded that had his views been more thoroughly understood by Clark and the other metaphysicians of our own country, or had Edwards appeared a century earlier, there would not have been the indiscriminate and undistinguishing abuse of this doctrine which then characterized and which still continues to mark the writings of the divines in the Church of England. 25. This is not the place for entering upon a discussion of the subject. It will be enough to observe that many are the advocates of a philosophical necessity in our present day who retain entire both the accountableness of man and the reality of moral distinctions, and to whom, therefore, this chapter of the analogy is wholly uncalled for. They hold that there is nothing in this doctrine which can do away, which can ever dilute or cast a dimness on the argument for a god from the symptoms of intelligence that are everywhere apparent in the constitution of visible things. They hold that there is nothing in it to nullify the doctrine of a moral government. They admit its consistency both with a will and a character in man and with a will and a character in God. In short, they conceive that it leaves every doctrinal and every practical principle of theology just where it found them. And whereas Dr. Butler would place us in this dilemma that our principles will not hold in practice, that after all we are obliged to act as if free, and that as the course of nature proceeds in its dispensation of rewards and punishments on the system of liberty, therefore that system must be true, we would retort by our utter unconsciousness of there being anything in that doctrine of necessity we so strenuously hold, which takes away from choice and deliberation and character in religion, that Butler himself reasons upon the consistency of our doctrine with all these things. And therefore, after all, it may not be so violent and monstrous a speculation as it was apprehended to be in his days, and as it is still apprehended to be among those anti-Calvinists of the South who profess to be revolted by the harsh and uncomplying features of our Scottish theology, by the horrors of its gloomy and repulsive Calvinism. 26. It is strange that Butler should labor to demonstrate, and indeed succeeds in demonstrating, that there is nothing in the system of necessity which ought to infer atheism, and yet that he should ascribe to the abettors of this system a disposition to atheism. Why does he not conceive it possible that a man may be a necessitarian, and yet have the very view he himself has of its bearing on the theistical argument? We often read of a man not being chargeable with all the consequences of his belief, because it is a possible thing that he may not perceive them. But here we have the example of a man being made chargeable with that which is not the consequence of his belief, and which is even proved to not be the consequence by the very person who makes the charge. This is one instance of the hard dealing in the way of moral and religious imputation to which necessitarians have been exposed at the hands of their adversaries. 27. He conceives that a pupil coming forth upon the world charged with the lessons of this system would abandon himself to utter carelessness in regard to his conduct. A few considerations put in the questionary form may perhaps disabuse the mind of this apprehension. Suppose a pupil of this doctrine were told that a certain line of conduct was often followed up by the contempt and hatred of society. What effect should this information naturally have upon him? To make him shun the conduct because fearful of its consequence. But suppose that instead of being told it was so followed up often, it was followed up always. Whether would this enhance or relax the prudential obligation to avoid the obnoxious conduct? Most certainly to enhance it, because now certain of its hurtful consequence. And whether does the being followed up often and the being followed up always present the likeliest sequence to those which would take place under the system of necessity? Or, instead of looking to the conduct of the pupil, let us look to that of the master or educationalist and put the following questions as to him. 1. Suppose he were told that the frequent effect of a certain argument, when presented to the minds of his pupils, was to recall them from a course of misconduct. What effect is this naturally fitted to have upon him? Surely to make him ply that argument. 2. 
Suppose that instead of the frequent, he was told that it was the constant effect of this argument, whether should that strengthen or weaken his inducement to press it home. The reply is obvious as any truism. 3. And whether in the frequent or in the constant is it that we recognize an invariable sequence in the constant? 4. But which of the two systems, that of liberty or necessity, is it which pleads for the sequences of the moral world being invariable? That of necessity. 5. Is there aught then in the said doctrine of necessity which has been so arraigned as the enemy alike of wisdom and virtue? Is there aught in it to lessen and not rather to strengthen and confirm all the motives to right conduct? So much for Butler's assertion that necessity is not applicable to practical subjects. 28. By the same mode of reasoning, it will be found that there is nothing in this doctrine to invalidate, but on the contrary, to fix all the more surely the inference for a God from final causes. We should infer, for example, a benevolence in God from the vast amount of happiness produced by the various mechanisms around us. But doubtless it would make the conclusion all the more certain if we conceived the connection to be invariable between a disposition in the mind of deity and the effect of that disposition in his works. But we need not dwell on this, as Butler himself thinks, that the doctrine of necessity is reconcilable with a character in God, and as reconcilable with the particular character of benevolence and truth and justice as any other. 29. There is one great oversight respecting the scheme of necessity into which our opponents are constantly falling, and in which Butler himself participates, else this chapter might have been spared. No doubt our necessity implies the absolute sureness of every event that is to happen, whether in the department of mind or of matter, but still it is a necessity not irrespective of that which went before the event, neither will it be without fruit or efficacy on that which is to follow. Ours is a necessity running in trains of sequences, and which is made up of the invariableness wherewith the terms of sequences follow each other. It is not necessity which fixes anything whatever in the character of an isolated or unconnected event, but of an event that came into being because of another that preceded it, and wherewith it is related by the tie of invariableness. Let the difference between these two necessities be well pondered, and it will be found that, in regard to influence on the practice of men, the one is toto coelo dissimilar from the other the necessity of which no other account can be given than that it has been fixed by some degree of inexorable fatalism and must therefore come to pass by whatever antecedents it has been preceded, or in the midst of whatever circumstances it is to spring into fulfilment. Such a necessity as this might well paralyze all the activity of man's doings or of man's deliberations, superseding as it does every effort of his to set aside the irrevocable sentence which he cannot annul and cannot make head against. But if, instead of this, it be a necessity not made good under whatever antecedents, but made good by those antecedents of which itself is but one of the consequence, a necessity not evolved into being in whatever circumstances, but a necessity essentially linked with these circumstances, and the mere result of that constancy in nature wherewith the same effect always proceeds from the same cause or combination of causes, then such a necessity as this, so far from chilling men into apathy and inaction, will be found as favorable to the development of all the energies of his active and intellectual nature as any system of liberty that can possibly be devised. 30. Grant that my earthly fortune is immutably determined in the chain of causes and effects. This does not dissolve, but rather strengthens the alliance between industry and prosperity, And so, under such a system, it is my right and rational part to put forth as much exertion as before for the purpose of realizing it. Grant that my eternal state is already made sure in the counsels of the eternal. This does not break up the affinity between a character on this side of death and a condition on the other side of it. And so, to make myself sure of a blissful eternity, I have the same inducement as ever to make good the faith and the holiness that always go before it. Grant that the salvation of my child has already been made the subject of a decree. It is not by a decree which but fastens and makes sure this individual event, but a decree which generally is carried into effect by the progression on the usual antecedents of prayer and example and instruction on the part of the parent. And so there should be no relaxation but the contrary of all those busy expedients which a father ought to ply for the immortal well-being of those who have sprung from him. There is not one of the connections between a cause and a consequent, between a means and an end, broken up by such a system of necessity. 
the connection is only made all the surer than before, instead of being that wayward, capricious, fluctuating thing which would make all activity hopeless and all prudence inapplicable or unavailing. It does not loosen, it cements the various parts which compose a mechanism of instrumentality, so that instead of paralyzing, it guides and animates human exertion when busily plying whatever instrument for the attainment of that good which it is fitted to realize. Let us be assured, therefore, that necessity, when rightly understood, instead of laying an arrest on the powers and purposes of man, or in any way destroying his spontaneity, leaves him as busy and active and vigilant and painstaking and diligent and ever doing a creature as before. End of section 7 Section 8 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the government of God considered as a scheme or constitution imperfectly comprehended. The Prayer O God, it is but a small part of thy ways that is submitted to our observation, and how then can we comprehend the mystery of thy government, the principle or the end of thine unsearchable counsels? We know but in part, we understand but in part, Give us, O Lord, in this the infancy of our being, to have all the teachableness and humility of children, and by the exercise of faith and charity those great virtues of our present and preparatory state, may we become meet for larger manifestations of that coming period when we shall know even as we are known. Meanwhile, O Lord, give us to understand not the piety alone, but the reason and wisdom of casting down all our lofty imaginations, and bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. All we ask is for his sake. Amen. 31. This chapter of Butler reminds one of a very fine observation by Leibniz. He bids us to consider the perfection, the exquisite harmony and adaptation of parts, the absolute faultlessness of every mechanism in nature which we can see in all its completeness, as, for example, an animal or vegetable, which is viewed as a system, is certainly one of most entire and orderly adjustment, and which, but for certain accidental and disturbing forces, it is quite obvious is fitted to maintain itself in a healthy and pleasurable state of existence. This is all the more wonderful that it is a system made up of so many parts, yet the want of any one of which, or even the want of it in a certain proportion, would derange the function of the organic apparatus altogether. Now let it be conceived that we only saw but a part of either of these, whether animal or vegetable, or saw them separated from their relation to the whole, such as a bit of skin or bone or membrane or muscle of the one, or a bit of root or bark or gummy exudation of the other, and how utterly meaningless or even deformed an article it would appear in our eyes, and yet, when seen in its proper place and by an eye that can take in that whole system of parts with their relations into which it enters, how significant, nay, how indispensable does it evince itself to be, proving the difference that must appear in respect to the use and wisdom of any given thing, when first exhibited to one who can only look to it in its individuality, and then to another who can look to it in connection with the entire combination whereof it forms a part. 32. Now this admits of an all-important application, and Leibniz has made the application most beautifully and effectively. Let us only conceive this world in the light of an individual or a part, which we might well do in relation to the immensity that surrounds it, and more especially since our modern science has made it known to us, that immensity teems with worlds and systems of worlds innumerable. And let us further conceive of our present generation, or rather, of all the ages put together, which the light of history irradiates, that they but disclose one temporary evolution of a plan which originated in the depths of the eternity that is past, and has its indefinite outgoings in the eternity before us, and then let us put the question whether, in proportion to God's universal scheme, we really have access, by our own observation, to more than the veriest fragment of any organic structure in the animal or vegetable kingdom. In the plainer language of Butler, individuals have certain peculiar relations to other individuals of their own species, nor do we know how far these relations extend, and hence this world, in the midst of this people universe, may be but as the individual of a mighty empire. And he further says that all events have future unknown consequences, and hence to estimate the character of present events or present appearances, we must ascertain their issues in the endless futurity on the other side of death. 
and so it comes again to the question whether a creature so beset and bounded in all his faculties as man can sit in judgment on the plans and counsels of a being whose eye reaches both to the infinite of space and the infinite of duration. Whether, with his limited access to so small a part of the universal machine and his short-lived observation to so small a time of its working, he, on present appearances, is at all warranted to pronounce upon the whole or to set aside the positive evidence of religion because of objections which can only be legitimately urged by one who knows the whole scope and evolution of the divine workmanship and the whole mind and purposes of its author. 33. From the doctrine of this chapter we may perceive how it is that in proportion to the enlargement of one's philosophy may be the submissiveness of his faith. A man of bounded views could not comprehend the solution given of the apparent difficulties of religion by such minds as those of Leibniz and Butler. He is conversant with individuals and not with relations, and least of all with that relation on which the answer to objectors is here suspended, the relation of his own little sphere to the vast unknown that is around it. He is incapable of conceiving the magnitude of duration as it reaches onward to eternity. He is alike incapable of conceiving the magnitude of space as it extends without limit on every side of us and holds within its ample reservoir an infinity of worlds. Such views as these call for a reach and elevation of sentiment which do not belong to him. But who does not see that in proportion to the capacity of making this wide survey of things must be the emphasis of the lesson which proceeds on our incapacity of resolving all, of reconciling all? In very proportion to the extent of our knowledge does there open upon us, though in dim perspective, that region of mystery where lie an exceeding multitude of things either wholly unknown to us or known but imperfectly. It is because, with every increase of diameter in the sphere of light, there is an increase of surface in the circumambient darkness. It is because, with every step of advance on the path of knowledge, the onward obscurity retires a little, no doubt, but at the place where it begins, is as deeply shrouded and presents a greater number of profound and unfathomable recesses than before. It is because, for example or illustration, the more powerful telescope, which now casts tenfold irradiation on the moon or on a planet, summons into vision millions of distant and hitherto unobserved suns, which but tell of their bare existence and leave in secrecy impenetrable both the moral and the physical economy of the unknown, of the unknown and the unnumbered worlds that roll around them. In a word, it is because every accession to the truths and the discoveries of science but brings into notice the still more impracticable difficulties, the still deeper arcana which lie beyond them. This is the reason why... While, on the one hand, a little learning is a dangerous thing, they are our highest and most colossal men who have evinced the most childlike modesty, both in the speculations of theology and of general learning. It is thus in particular that the cause of religion has nothing to fear from the cause of an ever-advancing, if legitimate, philosophy. The greater the number of objects that come within the circle of our contemplations, the greater also is the number of their unknown relations to the objects in the ulterior and untraveled distances, which she has not overtaken. By every footstep she takes in the search after truth, she is more baffled by a sense of her own incompetence to environ the truth that is infinite, the truth that is universal. And when, thus overwhelmed by the feeling of her own helplessness, she rises to the thought of that mighty spirit, who created and who alone therefore can comprehend all, she feels that one authentic note of information from him should outweigh a thousand of her own darkling speculations. 34. The concluding observations of this chapter are all important for the vindication of Butler's whole argument. They show most satisfactorily how our ignorance may invalidate the objections against, and yet not invalidate the proof of the thing. The essence of the reasoning here lies in the distinction between our knowledge of God's will and our knowledge of his ways. We have positive proof of his moral character, in virtue of which he wills both the righteousness and the happiness of his creatures, and yet may be utterly in the dark as to the most effectual ways or methods of procedure by which these objects can be most fully accomplished. We may know the end, and yet not know the best means of bringing it about. A total ignorance would place both the objections and the proof alike beyond our reach, but a partial ignorance may not. God's wisdom may be learnt by its vestiges within the limits of a mere handbreadth, as in the construction of an eye. Yet, after having learnt this, we may fail in our judgment of the subserviency of things that go out and far from view, whether widely in space or distantly in time, 
and so within the homestead of one's own conscience, may we read the lesson of a righteous God, and yet be wholly unable to pronounce on the tendency or effect of those measures which enter into the policy of his universal government. 35. The conclusion of the first part of the analogy calls for no particular remark, being in the main a recapitulation or summary of what had gone before. It is well that in the closing sentence he should discriminate so palpably between the proper proofs of religion and his own analogical reasonings in defense of it, it being the chief function of the latter to neutralize the objections of infidelity and of the former to build up a positive evidence, whether for the doctrine of the natural or the Christian theology. End of section 8. Section 9 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Importance of Christianity. The Prayer. Give us a deep sense, O God, of the weight and importance of that revelation which Thou hast made to the world. Make us to feel our need of the Saviour. Visit us with a spirit of concern and of inquiry. Shut us up by the terrors of Thy law to the faith of Thy gospel, and may we take no rest to our souls till we have found it in the revealed and offered mediator. May we hold it no light matter that we have sinned against God, that the denunciations of a violated law are upon us, and that the truth and justice and unchangeable holiness of thy nature are committed to the fulfillment of thy proclaimed threats on the children of iniquity. Do thou guide all our inquiries, whether on the truth or the substance of that message of reconciliation which thou hast sent into our abode. 1. From the introductory observations of this chapter, we might infer that Butler regards the question of the necessity of revelation as a preliminary to the question of its truth. It has certainly been so treated by the great majority, both of theological authors and of theological professors. They proceed as if the first point must be made out, ere they are warranted to enter upon the second, and in this way I hold not merely that a principle of sound reasoning has been violated, but that a general weakening has been inflicted thereby on the Christian argument. 2. The religion of Jesus Christ is essentially a religion of facts, and to its truth we have, through the medium of one branch of its evidences, the same direct access that we have to the truth of any other facts in general history. We have both an original and a derived testimony in behalf of its alleged miracles. We have the professed announcements from heaven to earth wherewith these miracles were associated. We have the record of these announcements, and for the integrity of this record we can hold up the very light which avails us in any question of ordinary criticism. We walk on firm experimental ground throughout the whole of this investigation and are led by it to the conclusion that within the whole compass of antiquity there has nothing come down to us in the shape of narrative so fully accredited as are the narratives of the gospel. Now, possessed as we are of such competent proofs on the credibility of this said revelation, are we to suspend the determination of it till the previous question of its necessity has been settled and set by? Are we to forego the consideration of the evidences which lie patent before us on the field of observation till we take up a matter, not so much, let it be noticed, of palpable fact as of recondite principle? The necessity of revelation involves in it topics that stand related both to God and to eternity, to the hidden counsels of the one, to the fathomless unknown, and by us undiscoverable of the other. The truth of revelation depends on credentials which lie on an open platform, or certain tangible things within the circle of our perceptions, which have been addressed to human eyes, which have been heard by human ears. It is not sound dialectics to suspend the second of these topics on the first of them. It is like placing a piece of firm architecture on a precarious foundation, it partakes of the vices of that philosophy which, anterior to the days of Lord Bacon, behooved to settle its principles before it would condescend to look upon facts. It is the same as if, instead of giving ourselves up to the business of observation in order to see what kind of planetarium the Creator had framed, we should keep this work at abeyance till we had rightly adjusted the speculation what kind of planetarium were best suited to our wants, or what the most reasonable for a God of perfect wisdom to have devised. The first sentence of Paley's work on the evidences is one of the best he has written. He puts aside the question of the necessity altogether. He treats it as one of the idle preliminaries of the main question. In the act of setting to, he brushes aside, as if by a single movement, the irrelevancies of the argument, and comes at once to close quarters with the matter on hand. 
I therefore should prefer that the student would read Paley before Leland, rather than that he should read Leland before Paley. Instead of possessing him at the outset with the slender probability, therefore God will do it, I should like better to possess him with the main strength and confidence of the proof that God has done it, and therefore it must have been necessary. 3. But it is not to be understood from these observations on the necessity of revelation that we have any other quarrel with the topic than merely with the place which is commonly assigned to it in the logic of our science. The topic itself is interesting, but it presents us with but an auxiliary consideration and is not entitled to a fundamental place in the argumentative evidence for the truth of Christianity. But there is another species of evidence to the effect of which, in conversion, the necessity of the gospel, or rather a sense of its necessity, is of prime and radical importance. We should distinguish between the historical necessity for a revelation under which the world labored before that the world was visited by its light, and that necessity, or rather that sense of necessity, which exists in the bosom of an individual visited by religious earnestness before that he had been visited by that understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings relief to his fears and a solution for his difficulties. This belongs not to the historical but to the internal evidence, and may be shortly stated thus. When a man is visited, as he often is, in his conscience, by a loftier and purer sense than he is wont to entertain of the law of God, when he is further visited, as he often is, in his consciousness by a more vivid conviction of his own distance and deficiency therefrom, when the apprehended truth and righteousness and justice of the lawgiver give him a more fresh and powerful impression than he ever had, that the high authority of heaven is not to be mocked, that its authority is not to be trampled on, when these considerations are brought to bear on the undoubted fact of himself being a defaulter, and he is therefore pressed with the difficulties of the problem, how can I escape from that condemnation which seems essential to be fulfilled, else the legislation of the upper sanctuary is but a mockery and a name. Here is a strong case of necessity made out, and if there be aught in the subject matter of the gospel to meet that necessity, the view of it not only ministers relief to the spirit of the inquirer, but at the same time carries a most pleasing and a most powerful evidence along with it, the evidence grounded on the adaptation which obtains between the offered remedy of the gospel and the felt necessities of our own nature, an evidence which no other system of religion has, it being the glory and distinction of the economy under which we sit, that it tenders a free and full forgiveness, yet without violence to the right of heaven's jurisprudence, to the state or dignity of heaven's offended sovereign. 4. Butler here tells us of Christianity as being, first, a republication of natural religion, and then, over and above, as being, in virtue of certain additional lessons and peculiarities of its own, what may be termed a supplement to natural religion. But it is worthy of all observation that every addition which Christianity makes to the clearness and authority of natural religion, so far from reducing, in fact aggravates the more our need of a revelation in all those matters which constitute the peculiarities of the gospel. It is a mistake, then, to imagine that, had it stopped short with a republication of the doctrines of natural theology, it would have done something in the way of positive addition and advantage for our species. It would but have added to their helplessness and despair, it would have made known to us, in a more vivid and alarming light, the disease under which we labor, and in so doing would have made our ignorance of the remedy more intolerably painful. Along with the brighter views which it gave of the obligation and extent of the law, of the august and inviolable sanctity of the lawgiver, of the authority of that moral government under which we sit, of the awful and unchangeable sanctions by which it was upholden, Along with these, it would not darken, but rather supply new and convincing evidence to the fact that from heaven's rectitude we had universally fallen, and that heaven's jurisprudence had by one and all of us been violated. We should not, therefore, say of this second part of the Christian revelation merely that it was additional to the first. The first, in fact, has more in it the character of the proposition of an enigma, and the second brings the solution to it. The first gives us more emphatically to feel our danger and our difficulties. The second brings the way of deliverance before us. There is a necessity for revelation, but it is a mistake to imagine that what it reveals to us of natural religion does away one half of the necessity. It may be said in the first instance, rather to thicken the perplexity of an inquirer and to deepen still more the obscurity of the prospect which lies before him. The first without the second would have been a message of terror and denunciation to the world. It is the second which reconciles all difficulties, and, besides adding the light of its own manifestation to all that we previously knew of the things of an invisible world, 
It resolves all the doubts and hushes all the fears which the first had awakened. 5. In addition to the clear and admirable observations of Bishop Butler in this chapter on the distinction between moral and positive duties, we have only to remark that, though the former be of higher value in themselves, and of higher estimation in the sight of God than the latter, yet obedience to the latter may be often a more discriminative and decisive test of a man's religiousness than obedience to the former. A moral duty has both the will of God and its own native rectitude to recommend it, and in as far as the last of these two motives is concerned, it is often felt and proceeded on in virtue of the natural morality among men. There are many who would recoil from fraud, who would act on the impulse of generosity, who would maintain courteousness in their fellowship with others, wholly apart from the consideration of a lawgiver in heaven. But to keep the Sabbath, for example, is not a dictate of natural morality at all. There is not the same composition of influences concerned in this that there is in those duties which possess a natural rectitude antecedent to all jurisprudence. The will of God is more singly and separately our inducement for the observance of this or any other of the positive institutions, so that, when there is neither hypocrisy nor the mechanical influence of habit in the case, the circumstance of a man being a good Sabbath-keeper may be a more decisive indication of that which strictly and philosophically one would denominate religiousness of character than the circumstance of a man being a good neighbor, a good payer of his debts, a good landlord, or possessed of any one or all of those qualifications which, in the ordinary sense of the term, constitute a good member of society. 6. At the close of this chapter we meet with a sentiment of most unsafe tendency and application in the hands of those who do not estimate aright the natural ignorance of man, and so would invest him with a mastery over a far larger range of speculation than with his beset and bounded faculties he is at all able to overtake. It is that, quote, if in Revelation there be found any passages, the seeming meaning of which is contrary to natural religion, we may certainly conclude such seeming meaning not to be the real one, end quote. It is under the cover of such a sentiment that both infidelity and heresy have indulged in all sorts of licentiousness, the one in rejecting Christianity and the other in transforming it. Nothing can be more obvious than that Christianity must be so understood as to square with the certainties of all known truth, or to be rejected altogether, whether that truth lie in the department of natural religion or anywhere else, but it is equally obvious that the theology of the Bible should be brought to the tribunal of an antecedent natural theology only in so far as it is a just and right natural theology, or to the extent only in which its doctrines are clear and unquestionable, else any revelation, however well accredited, were liable to be either misinterpreted or set aside, and that on the authority of every hypothesis, however wanton and however presumptuous. There is no danger of a conflict between reason and revelation when reason keeps within her own proper sphere and proceeds aright on the knowledge and observation of her own limits. But these limits are often transgressed both by the proud and the imaginative, and hence it is that deism on the strength of her natural religion has passed sentence of condemnation on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Socinianism on the strength of hers has diluted it to the quality of its own meagerness. End of section 9 Section 10 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the supposed presumption against a revelation considered as miraculous. The Prayer. We desire, O God, to do homage to the Son in all our approaches to the Father. We esteem it a faithful saying that He is the only name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. We make mention of him as the Lord our righteousness, and we pray that he may be made unto us the Lord our strength. May his word dwell in us richly in all wisdom, and may the spirit which is at his giving animate us with all strength in the inner man, that we may not be justified only, but also washed and sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the spirit of our God. 7. Butler was antecedent to Hume nor is it very clear from what appears in this chapter how he would have met the subtle objections of this last-named philosopher, though probably by an appeal to the obvious phenomena of belief in testimony. I am not sure that he would have done more than this. He would have likened miracles to the extraordinary phenomena of nature, and then adverted to the perfect confidence wherewith these are listened to and received on the report of credible eyewitnesses. 
He would have bestowed a few touches of his sagacity upon the question, but neither his taste nor perhaps his talent would have led him so thoroughly to scrutinize the argument as to disarm it of all power to puzzle and to deceive us. 8. Nevertheless, the observations which he has bequeathed upon this subject have not been overlooked by those who followed him in the work of sustaining the Christian religion against the assaults of infidelity. It is evident that both Campbell and Price felt the importance even of the brief remarks which have fallen from him, and the former, in particular, makes use of the argument that he draws from that power even of a very slight testimony to accredit what, but for that testimony, would have had a very strong improbability against it. But there is a peculiarity here overlooked, I think, by all the three reasoners. They suppose, in the first instance, a series of events to have come gratuitously into one's mind, and after stating the almost infinite number of chances against its being true, suppose, in the second instance, these very elements to be deponed to by a credible witness. Now, that both the first and the second of these things should happen in coincidence together were the strongest possible unlikelihood, and Butler says truly that the presumption against a miracle is a small presumption additional to this, for, in fact, this were itself a miracle. After that, in the silent depository of my own thoughts, I had figured a story made up of complex and various incidents, another should present himself and narrate the identical story in all its particulars, deponing at the same time to the truth of it. This were not an ordinary testimony to an ordinary series of events. The man who did so I should credit with the power of divination. I should regard him as a prophet, and, instead of having the mere commonplace marks of credibility about him, I should view him as armed with the vouchers of a miraculous personage. To predict ordinary events in the very way they are to happen were not more extraordinary than for one man to divine ordinary events in the very way that another has conceived them. And the case is altogether different when, instead of the story being for the first time presented to me by my own imagination, it is for the first time presented to me in the plain narrative of a plain witness, and when, instead of bringing to me the marvellous confirmation of a mere reverie of my own, he brings, ab extra, and from the place whence he came, a narrative of events that took place under his own observation. The proper way of estimating the strength of the presumption against, or the proof that would be necessary for the establishment of a miracle, is to bring it into comparison, not with the presumption against the truth of a previously conceived story, but with the presumption against the truth of an already reported story that related to events which were not miraculous. There will be found in this case a difference very much greater than the small additional presumption which Butler speaks of, and so, however striking or original his observation may be, there seems nothing in it which can guide us into a right track for the solution of the difficulty that since his time has so exercised the skill of the controversialists. End of section 10. Section 11 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of our incapacity of judging what were to be expected in a revelation, and the credibility from analogy that it must contain things appearing liable to objections. The Prayer. We esteem it, O God, a faithful saying that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and we accept with thankfulness all the information which thou hast given respecting the design and the efficacy of his death. We would receive with gratitude and with faith the announcement that he died as a propitiation for the sins of the world, and that this propitiation was rendered that mercy and truth might meet together, and that righteousness and peace might enter into fellowship. We would carry our speculation no farther than to the plain verities and informations of the Bible, and desire to rejoice in these as worthy of our most cordial acceptance. 9. This we hold to be a very important chapter, both because of the satisfactory deliverance which it makes on the special topic, and of the insight which it gives into the spirit and philosophy of Butler's whole argument as grounded on a very clear perception of the limit between the knowable and the unknowable, and of the treatment due to the respective things which belong to the one or the other of these regions. Let there be but evidence to the amount of establishing the certainty, or even the probability of what actually exists in the first, and this will completely overbear any presumption founded on what is only guessed at or imagined in the second. The spirit evinced by our author is identical with that of the experimental or the Baconian philosophy, a spirit, in the first instance, of the utmost hardihood in resolutely maintaining to be true all that accords with the findings of experience, 
and a spirit in the second instance of the utmost humility, in that sentiment of utter diffidence and distrust wherewith it regards all the fancies of presumptuous, however plausible, speculation. 10. With this principle, which in its very essence is a Baconian one, then, on sufficient evidence, we shall admit of a thing that so it is, although profoundly ignorant of how it is. To speak in the language of the scholastics, it is evidence, and that alone which must determine the quiddity of anything, and of this we may have all possible degrees of belief up to thorough conviction. Under the most perfect and entire ignorance of the quomodo of that thing, we are forced by sense and experience to admit that the course of nature is such, and yet may not be able even to approximate to the solution of the question, why such? And, in like manner, we may be led by evidence of another sort, by the evidence of credible testimony, for example, which after all resolves itself by tracing back the process of derivation into the evidence of sense and experience. We may be led by this evidence to believe that such is the scheme of an actual revelation from heaven, and yet may not be able to explain how it is such a scheme rather than another. The objection founded on the scheme being such as it is, and that in the face of evidence for its being the actual scheme of an actual revelation, is just an irrationality of the same sort as to refuse the evidence of the senses in regard to the actual course of nature, because it is a course, the reasons and principles of which we do not comprehend. To be able to comprehend them, we would need such an acquaintance as we have not, with the plans and the purposes and the policy of him who is the ruler of nature. To presume then on some plan imagined by ourselves as being indeed the plan of the eternal mind, and to quarrel with the phenomena, whether of nature or of a proved revelation, as being not agreeable thereto, is to fetch something from the terra incognita of conjecture, and with it to overbear another something brought home, whether in the shape of a certainty or of a probability, from the terra cognita of observation. This is the very spirit which Bacon would abjure, which Newton would abjure, which every sound experimentalist of the present day would abjure. It is wrong in the things of natural, it is wrong in the things of supernatural knowledge. And could we only succeed in tutoring the spirits of our young disciples to the truth and the soberness of that logic, which we are now laboring to impress, it would, on the former of those grounds, conduct them to a right philosophy, and on the latter to a right faith. 11. The object of this chapter is to prove the likelihood in the general of a revelation being liable to objections, or at least that its being so forms no proper ground for the rejection of it. This reduces us to the consideration of its proofs, as the only relevant inquiry that we have to do with. Doubtless every objection against these proofs must be entertained and satisfactorily disposed of, but this is different from objections against the subject matter of a revelation. These form what are here called its internal improbabilities, much insisted on by deists, but all proceeding on the competency of the human understanding to decide upon a topic which is here shown to be much too high for it, we being no more judges beforehand of what a revelation ought to be, either in the way it ought to be conducted or what it should contain, than we are judges anterior to experience of what ought to be the course of nature. The alleged imperfections and anomalies in the methods by which Christianity distributed and gave forth her lessons are most effectually met by the analogous imperfections and anomalies, if such they must be called, as contrary to all the likelihoods of previous expectation that might be observed in the gifts and teaching of nature. 12. It is thus that he demonstrates the invalidity of objections against the subject matter of Christianity, while he admits that objections against its proofs were quite fatal to the authority of that religion, could they only be made good, as, for example, could it be shown that there was an infirmity in the evidence for its miracles, or a failure in its prophecies, or even a flaw and blemish in its morality, or, he might have added, an inconsistency between its averments and previously known truth. We think him particularly effectual in his vindication of the scripture morality when he combats the exceptions which have been alleged against it on the ground of an apparent approval given by it to crimes as the spoiling of the Egyptians by the commandment of God and the extermination of the Canaanites. But for the divine commandment they certainly would have been crimes, while with that commandment they are no more to be regarded as such than the fines or the capital punishments inflicted by a court of justice should be regarded as examples either of theft or murder. In these instances, the Israelites were but the executioners of a sentence, and to charge immorality on the procedure is to confound the administrative acts of a government with its laws. 13. The question may be here put, 
what would have been our condition had the moral and the miraculous evidence for Christianity run counter to each other. It is somewhat analogous to a puzzle in ethical science which meets and perplexes its disciples in the discussion of its elementary principles. It is the general sentiment of moralists, and we think a sound one, that virtue has an independent rightness of its own apart from all consideration of the will of God, yet this might not prevent the inquiry what would have been our obligation had it so happened that the deity had come forth with an authoritative enactment on the side of all that conscience tells us to be wrong, and in opposition to all that the same conscience tells us to be right. It is well that the miraculous and the moral have not thus come into collision with each other, any more than the miraculous and the mathematical have come into collision. We should have been in a sad dilemma had a professed messenger from the upper sanctuary appeared upon earth, and after authenticating his commission by a miracle, had prescribed to us a moral code which reversed, we shall imagine, all the enactments of the Decalogue, and we should have been in a like dilemma had he affirmed to be true what we knew on the competent evidence, whether of sense or reason, to be false. Let us rejoice that, in the economy under which we sit, no perplexity of this sort has ever been realized, that Christianity, whenever it touches on things experimental, will bear to be confronted with experience, and whenever it touches on things ethical or moral, is found to be at one with the lessons of purest and most enlightened virtue, and that to such a degree as not only to stand disencumbered from all objection upon this score, but to such a degree as to have founded a strong positive evidence in its favor on that wisdom and that righteousness by which its whole system is throughout characterized. The perfection of its morality forms one of the brightest insignia of its divinity and truth. 14. The analogical reasoning of this chapter is all triumphant when applied to the vindication of Christianity, notwithstanding the charge of its not being universal, or of its slow progress in the world, or of the difficulty and labor which attend the inquiry into its evidences, so as to be satisfied of its truth. The same impediments and the same limitations obtain in regard to the light of natural knowledge, and that too, in things so important as remedies against otherwise fatal disease and the most useful discoveries in science. End of section 11. Section 12 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Christianity considered as a scheme or constitution imperfectly comprehended. The Prayer. We approach Thee, O Lord, as the God and Father of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We rejoice that in Him there is full acceptance, and that also through Him strength is made to descend on us for all right and holy obedience. We feel that in Him all our sufficiency lies, that without Christ we can do nothing, and that but for the Spirit, which is at His giving, there is no good thing either in our hearts or in our history. May he begin a good work in our souls, may he carry it forward to perfection, that, advancing from one degree of moral and spiritual excellence to another, we may at length be found prepared for the joys and the exercises of a blissful eternity. 15. It were a great and unwarrantable presumption to decide on the personal Christianity of Butler, but I may at least remark on the possibility, nay, I would even go so far as to say the frequency of men, able and accomplished and zealous for the general defense of Christianity, being at the same time meager and vague in their views of its subject matter. I might state it as my impression of our great author, that when he does offer his own representations on the form and economy of that dispensation under which we sit, he seems to me as if not prepared to state the doctrines of our faith in all that depth and peculiarity wherewith they are rendered in the New Testament. That man achieves a great service who, by strengthening the outworks of our Zion, places her in greater security from the assaults of the enemy without. But that man, I would say, achieves a higher service who can unfold to the friends and disciples who are within the glories of the inner temple. Now I will say of Butler that he appears more fitted for the former than for the latter of these achievements. I would trust him more on the question who the letter comes from than I would on the question what the letter says, and I do exceedingly fear that living as he did at a period when a blight had descended on the Church of England, at a time when rationality was vigorous but piety was languid and cold, at a time when there had been a strong revulsion from the zeal and the devotedness and with all the occasional excesses of Puritanism, I do fear, I say, that this illustrious defender of the repository which held the truth 
would have but inadequately expounded in all its richness and personal application the truth itself. I think it but fair to warn you that up and down throughout the volume there do occur the symptoms of a heart not thoroughly evangelized, of a shortness and a laxity in his doctrinal religion, of a disposition perhaps to nauseate as fanatical those profound impressions of human depravity and the need of a saviour and the virtue of his atoning sacrifice and the utter helplessness of man without the spirit of God, not to reform merely but to renew, not to amend but to regenerate, not to fan into vitality the latent sparks of virtue and goodness which may be supposed originally to reside in the human constitution, but to quicken him from his state of death in trespasses and sins." so that from a child of the world he may be transformed into one of the children of light, who aforetime alive only to things of sense, become now alive to the things of faith, alive to God. There is nothing I feel less disposed to exercise than the office of a jealous or illiberal inquisitor upon one who has yielded so high the polemic arm in the battles of the faith. But I would caution you when I meet with such an expression as that of the Holy Ghost given to good men, against the delusion of this preternatural aid being only given for the purpose of helping further onward those who have previously, and by dint of their own independent exertions, so far helped themselves. I would have you to understand that the intervention of this heavenly agent is the outset of conversion and accompanies all the stages of it. He is not only given in larger measure to good men, but he makes men good. He is not only given to those who obey him, but he makes a willing and an obedient people in the day of his power. He is present at the incipient as well as at the subsequent movements of the religious life, acting on men in the lowest depths of their alienation from God, and conferring both a significancy and a fulfillment of the prayer of, Turn me, O God, and I shall be turned. 16. At the same time I know not a more important lesson than can be urged from the pulpit than that which flows from the relation between the Holy Spirit and those who are the subjects of his influence. When Butler speaks of this influence as given to good men, it may be necessary to pause a little ere we have settled the full orthodoxy of the question, but after this has been done we are not aware of a more momentous truth than that which lies involved in the assertion of our great author. If by his being given to good men it may be understood that he descends in larger measure and brighter manifestation on those who have made a faithful and a conscientious use of his blessed influences, there cannot be a juster and sounder affirmation or one that bears more importantly on the interests of practical religion. You are familiar with the idea that the effect of God working in us is just to set us a working, that when he addresses himself to the object of putting a human being into a right state of character and operation, he does so without violence to any of the powers or principles of the human constitution, that he gives clearness to the understanding and sensibility to the conscience and rectitude to the will and strength to the practical determinations, and effect to that whole process of thought and sentiment and reason which connects the first feeble desires with the ultimate and the finished doings of righteousness, so that really this creature, subjected though he has been to an influence without him and above him, not only looks but really is in every way as active and spontaneous and busy and hard-working a disciple, as if no special interposition on the part of any high and heavenly agent had been required. Now we know not how far back a decided visitation of this sort may have commenced, but we may at least appeal to the experience of every man who breathes, that alienated though he be from the life and the light of Christianity, he can at least do something, and that his conscience, under all its present oblivion, has not left him wholly without direction as to the right and the wrong. We know not how far back in the movements either of remorse for the evil or of desire towards the good in the character we may recognize the first embryo aspirations after Christianity, or even Christianity itself in its incipient and rudimental form. The apostolic direction to an already advanced and confirmed Christian of stir up the gift that is in thee is applicable to one and all within the reach of our voice. There is a certain degree of light, there is a certain measure of strength, for the right use of which every individual is responsible, and to whom the declaration of Scripture is applicable, that to him who hath more shall be given, and that from him who hath not shall be taken away that which he hath. By a faithful and conscientious application of all that we do know, we work our way, as it were, to a revelation of what we at present do not know. By a right exercise of the strength that we do possess, we are nurtured into more strength, and that not merely under the influence of habit as made known to us by experience, but under the influence of the Spirit as made known to us in Scripture. 
He, in fact, is represented there as a personal agent whose office it is to conduct us onward from one degree of grace and virtue to another, and whose nature is to feel affected by the treatment that we give him, whether of welcome or of resistance. He is invited by the one, he is grieved and discouraged by the other. He strives but will not strive continually. If we persevere in our opposition, he in fine lets us alone, and at last, quenched by our obstinacy, he takes irrevocable leave of us. This is the particular economy made known to us in Scripture, and you will at once perceive how, with a thorough recognition of the part which the Spirit of God has in the work of our progressive holiness, it secures the entire practical character of urgency and moral suasion in all our addresses to the Spirit of man. It connects the supply and enlargement of future influence with the use that we make of present influence. It lays upon us the present and the perpetual obligation of stirring up all that is actually within us at every given instant to the work of obedience. And when, along with this, we recollect that it is not by a mechanical but by a moral necessity that he operates, that he addresses himself to man as man, and instead of working against, works altogether by the powers and the principles of our spontaneous nature, there cannot be imagined a system under which, when rightly understood and proceeded on, man is more put on the strenuous exertion of all the activities which belong to him. 17. When thus viewed, you will perceive that the further back you carry the work of the Spirit in the history of conversion, the further back do you carry along with it the urgency and the power of the considerations which we are now insisting on. Grant that he originates as well as advances and carries forward our Christianity, this is but saying that he is the author of the first and the faintest motions toward what is good, as well as of those more decided aspects and tendencies which take place afterwards in the progress of this discipleship. Or, in other words, whenever such motions are to be found, you can bring the same impressive argument to bear upon them. Obey them, and they will be followed up by higher visitations. Stifle them, and even they will subside into acquiescence, and you will lapse into that most hopeless of all states, a state of immovable lethargy and unconcern. The orthodoxy which inclines to carry furthest back the doctrine of a spiritual influence, so as to make that influence the source and commencement of the whole, just leads us to carry as far back the moral or the hortatory lesson that is founded thereupon. Instead of chilling man into inaction, it gives a more decidedly practical outset to his Christianity, and this is another instance of the union which I should like, if I could make as clearly palpable as may be to the eye of every understanding, the union between the soundly dogmatic in the principles of theology and the freely and urgently hortative in its practical lessons. End of section 12. Section 13 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the particular system of Christianity, the appointment of a mediator, and the redemption of the world by him. The Prayer. O God, thou art emphatically the being with whom we have to do, and how sad then the thought that in the vast multiplicity of our doings thou art so seldom and so little thought of, Give us to feel the burden of our alienation from thyself. Reclaim us from the deep ungodliness of nature, and whereas in time past we have been dead to thee and alive to the world, may we henceforth die to the world and become alive to God. Naturally we stand afar off from the Father of our spirits. May we be brought nigh through him who died, the just for the unjust. For his sake forgive our innumerable offences, and receive us graciously and love us freely. All we ask is in the name of Christ. Amen. 18. The sufferings of one person are often the medium of procuring benefits for others. The painful consequences of our actions are sometimes removed either in the course of nature or by the interposition of others. Here is an indication first of severity and then of compassion on the part of God, and it furnishes an analogy between the system of nature and that of revelation. This analogy does away objections to the mediation of Christ, but our proof of it comes from revelation. The Sicinian merges all the attributes of God into modifications of benevolence, but there will be misgivings of conscience in spite of his sentimental representations of the deity. The hope of the Christian is one that can bear to be confronted with the whole unmutilated character of God without being obliged to put any of his attributes into the background. There is a difference between goodness and compassion. Goodness may be regarded as the genus comprehending mercy and compassion as species. 
The object of compassion is misery. The object of mercy is guilt. The Socinians wish to make truth, justice, and the other attributes of mercy to be modifications of benevolence too, but the atonement is a great impregnable argument on the side of the orthodoxy system. 19. Butler says, very properly, that the necessity of an atonement arises from the universal ruin of the world. He disapproves of certain speculative objections, such as whether any other way of mediation could have been devised, and what would have been the fate of the better sort of men if Christ had not come into the world. He refuses to entertain such questions, observing that we do not know the whole of the matter. I do think, however, that he blinks the question of the obvious meaning of the sacrifice. He confines himself to generalities of expression, with the apparent view of shunning the specific import of Christ's death being a sacrifice for sin. He admits the scriptural statement, but I do have the feeling of an inclination on his part to slur over the obvious sense and meaning of the statement. I should not like to bear hard upon our inestimable author, but I may at least take this occasion of adverting for a few moments to a habit of those who call themselves rationalists in theology. They profess that their taste is for what is plain and lucid in theology, and along with this they profess an utter loathing for mystery. Hence their relish for the plainly moral and devotional pieces in the volume of inspiration, such as the Psalms or the Proverbs. Hence their preference for the preceptive to the doctrinal parts of Scripture, their liking for the Gospels, their aversion to the epistles of the New Testament. 20. It were well if we could settle in our own minds what is meant by the mysteriousness of a thing, and how it is, that the mysteriousness is dissipated. I beg you will advert to the distinction which there is between a proposition and the reason of a proposition. The one may be clearly understood, while the other lies in profoundest secrecy from our view. In this case, the proposition will still continue to be termed mysterious, and that you will observe, though the meaning of it be clearly comprehended, is just because the reason of it is not comprehended. The thing stated may be understood as a fact, but not understood in connection with its principle. Now, attend to what that is which you precisely gain, after all, by the discovery of a principle, or by the discovery of that, the knowledge of which is thought to do away the mysteriousness in question. Take any fact in nature, for an example. The mind may be fully satisfied as to the reality of the fact, but utterly in the dark as to the reason of it. There is a mystery connected with it because of this, and there occur to us two ways in which the feeling of mystery might be done away. First, let me suppose the fact to be an observed sequence— as that when A is presented, C is continually sure to follow. There can be no misunderstanding the statement of this fact, and it is conceivable that it may have the utmost degree of observational evidence in its favour. The reality of the connection between A and C may be abundantly made sure to us, but we want to know the reason of the connection, or what the ligament is that binds these two terms so invariably together. Perhaps then, on a closer observation, we may discover something intermediate between A and C that will reveal to us the ligament. We may find that B occurs between the two, and forms, in fact, a stepping stone from the one to the other. The mind is regaled by such a discovery. It has found the modus of a connection that was before inexplicable. The reason why A is followed by C is conceived to be because of the intervention of B— in which explanation of the phenomenon it may perhaps acquiesce and be satisfied. 21. But the curiosity of some is not so easily appeased, nor is their appetency for the reasons of things so soon satisfied. The question, why is A followed up by C, may be followed by the equally reasonable and pertinent question, why is A followed up by B? The connection between A and C was felt to be mysterious, till the intermediate B was discovered, but we mistake the matter if we yet think that the mysteriousness is chased away, for both the connection between A and B and that between B and C may be still felt to be alike mysterious. 22. To get rid of this feeling, we may address ourselves to the new task of ascertaining the ligament between A and B, and we may either succeed or fail in it. If we succeed, the mysteriousness of the connection between A and B is now cleared away. But how? just by the interposition of another term, just by the manner in which the mysteriousness of the connection between A and C was cleared away, just by the discovery of a before-hidden and intermediate fact lying between A and B, just, in short, by a something which may leave the spirit of inquiry as restless and unsatiated as ever, for still there is room for the question whence the connection between the prior term A and this new interpolated mean in the series of causation or whence the connection between this mean and the posterior term B. 
23. All this has been well unfolded by the masterly hand of Dr. Thomas Brown, and he grafts upon it what I have no hesitation in pronouncing to be the wisest and the weightiest philosophical aphorism that was ever framed, and as solid as it is profound, that, quote, either nothing is mysterious or everything is mysterious, end quote. Now, I would have you observe how differently it is that two distinct classes of people in mind and intellect are affected by this contemplation, the one set resting all their convictions in the realities of fact and phenomena and observational evidence, the other never resting but haunted by the feeling of a mysteriousness which, with their utmost efforts, they can never chase away. The former, satisfied by observation, believe in the reality of the sequence between A and C, the latter perhaps almost suspending their belief in its reality till they have discovered the reason of it. I dispute not in the use of the principle by which the latter are actuated. It may have been the impellent force which led to the discovery both of B and of the still more hidden intermediate term, and may even lead to further discoveries in the series. End of section 13. Section 14 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the want of universality in revelation and of the supposed deficiency in the proof of it. The Prayer. In thy light, O God, may we clearly see light. Give us to recognize in the book of thy counsel the impress which thou hast there given of thyself. Enable us to discern the truth and the holiness and the majesty and all the other high characteristics of the divinity which are stamped upon its pages. We rejoice and are convinced by its precious adaptations to the wants of our moral nature, enable us to verify it still more by the experience of having had all those wants satisfied. May our willingness to do thy will conduct us to the knowledge of Christ's doctrine as having come indeed from God. 24. One great lesson of Butler's analogy is the propriety of conforming ourselves to the actual state of the circumstances in which we are placed. One evidence which the early Christians had in larger measure than we was derived from the lives of the early professors, which shone with a much brighter luster than in our day. Any deficiency in the evidence of revelation will be made up by the fulfillment of prophecy, and we trust also by the exemplary lives of Christians. 25. The statement of Butler that people will be judged according to the light they have received is just, but it has been perverted to the object of nullifying the importance of religious light and is a sentiment which we have often heard applied in opposition to missionary enterprises and which, if just in an argument against these, would be alike just against the mission of the apostles, nay, against the mission of Christ himself to the world. 26. Objections to the evidence of Christianity as not being obvious are met by saying that the Christian dispensation is one of trial, and that this obscurity may be part of the probation. Man's dissatisfaction with Christianity does not always arise from want of evidence, but from his not setting himself earnestly and rightly to seek it. The unbelief of such inquirers resolves itself into carelessness and want of inquiry. End of section 14 Section 15 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the particular evidence for Christianity. The Prayer. We bless thee, O God, that with signs and wonders and diverse miracles thou didst usher into the world the message of its salvation. We rejoice in thinking that the God of nature, and who made such visible assertion of his supremacy over all its processes, is the author of our Christianity. We bless thee for the evidences of our faith, for the ample means which thou hast afforded us for giving to every man a reason for the hope that is in us, for the light that shines around the history of the gospel, and above all for that surpassing light which, radiating from the gospel itself, shines into the hearts of those who believe. May we give earnest heed to the word of this testimony, and persevere therein till the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. 27. At the place where we now find ourselves, Butler makes a transition in his argument. He passes from the subject matter of Christianity to its evidence. He has hitherto been employed in removing the objections against Christianity itself by the argument of analogy, and by the same engine he now proceeds to remove the objections that may be leveled against the proof of it. The two objects are altogether distinct. 
By succeeding in the one, he may have said nothing which can positively recommend Christianity to our acceptance. But he does a great deal if, by nullifying the objections of adversaries, he simply places it in a midway condition between the negative and the affirmative, and therefore open to a favorable impulse from any argument which might be alleged in its favor. It is a great matter to relieve the subject from the burden of any disproof which may be conceived to lie upon it. After having done which, it may still remain in the state of not proven, nay, in such a state of absolute neutrality that not the slightest probability may have yet been alleged in its behalf. But it is well that it should be brought into such a state as that the very slightest probability will tell. And now, having accomplished his task thus far, he proceeds in the chapter before us, after having met by analogy the objections which are leveled against the contents of Christianity, to meet, by the same weapon of repulse, the objections which are leveled against its credentials. 28. In the discharge of this second service he is not called upon to propound very fully, or in the way of positive vindication, the evidences of Christianity. He adverts to them. He states what they are, he even renders a passing homage to their authority and force, but his proper task is to do by them what he had done before by the subject matter of revelation, that is, clear away the objections, not now against the doctrine of Christianity, but against the proof of it, and that by showing that the similar or analogous objections in other cases are not admitted to have the validity which, in the case of the evangelical story, the opponents of the gospel would fain allow to them. By accomplishing the first service, he disencumbers Christianity of objections and brings it into a free state for the application of the proof. By the accomplishment of the second service, he disencumbers the proof itself of its objections and leaves it to its own proper and positive force in the upholding of Christianity. His argument does not call upon him to offer any absolute computation of this force. This will be done by Dr. Paley in our next textbook which will follow in the most orderly succession that can well be imagined after the great preliminary service which is rendered by Bishop Butler. End of section 15section 16 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain of the objections which may be made against arguing from the analogy of nature to religion. The Prayer. We bless thee, O God, that after having at diverse times and in sundry manners spoken to them of old time by the prophets, thou hast at length spoken to us by thine own Son. And we further bless thee that after thy Son had left the world, he left not the world without a witness, but that he left the word of his testimony and the promise of his Spirit for the guidance of all future generations. May we give earnest heed thereto, and not cease the busy application of all our faculties to the revelation of thy will, till the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. May the growing evidence of the Bible be to us as the shining light which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. 29. A position, whether it relates to a doctrine or a matter of fact, admits of all gradations in regard to the state of its credibility. In the first place, there may be positive reasons for believing that it is not true, in which case it may be regarded as a minus state with regard to its credibility. There is evidence on the question whether the position be true or not, and this evidence is against it, requiring, therefore, an equal force of evidence on the opposite side to neutralize it, and a still greater degree to overbalance it, so as to give a positive impression in its favor. 30. Or, which is quite a different state in regard to the question of a thing's credibility from the former, there may be no reason either for or against the truth of a given proposition, nothing which may incline us to one or other side of a question, placing it, therefore, neither in a plus nor minus condition in regard to evidence, but just on the line of demarcation between them. I would say of a proposition when thus situated that it was in a state of zero. In reference to my knowledge, a proposition like this, that Cicero was above the middle size, is precisely in such a state, and countless other things of the same sort can be specified. It is obvious that in this state of any proposition there is nothing to neutralize, nothing either to countervail or to get the better of, and that for the object of advancing it to the rank of a probability, it lies open to the smallest proof or presumption on the positive side of the question. 31. Now I hold it to be the achievement of a very great service in behalf of any doctrine, if you can transfer it from the first to the second state now specified. If from its station on the minus side you can place it on the line of demarcation, although you bring it not over to the plus or positive side, 
you in this way secure its full strength and benefit to the positive argument. You as yet supply no proof, but you nullify all disproof, and placing the balance on an even scale, you lay it open to an inclination on the favourable side by the least force which can possibly be applied to it. This I hold to have been the main service of Butler in the treatise which we are now on the eve of finishing. To avail ourselves of an expression in this chapter, although the analogies which he instances do not contribute one iota of proof to the establishment of anything as true, they do a very great deal if they establish that, for aught we know, they may be true. The doctrine, for example, of punishment hereafter for misconduct here is, at the very least, susceptible of being proved thus far by analogy. That perhaps it may, for aught we know, be true, although we are in possession of no such analogies as can enable us to prove that it is true. It goes most completely to neutralize any disbelief that may be alleged against the doctrine on the ground of its inconsistency with the character of God, when you can allege that under the government of that God the very same thing, of misconduct being followed at longer or shorter intervals by suffering, takes place in the course of experience. That it happens here may not be a sufficient reason that it shall happen there, but a most sufficient reason that it may happen there. The analogy has taken this proposition out of the class of unlikelihoods, and even though it should not have transferred it to the opposite class of likelihoods, it is a great thing if it should only have placed it in a state of indifference, whence it may be made to ascend in the scale by the force of other conclusions and other arguments. But Butler claims more in the way of virtue for his argument than this, and let us now therefore endeavor to appreciate the validity of that claim. 32. In the first place, I would have you understand how it says nothing for the power of analogy to furnish a positive argument on the side of Christianity, that it is applicable not merely to the removal of objections against Christianity itself, but also to the removal of objections against the proof of Christianity. After having accomplished the former service, it leaves the subject in a state of indifference, which is far better, certainly, than a state of discredit. But after having accomplished the latter service, it leaves Christianity in a state of positive credit. But it is not analogy, you will observe, which puts it into this positive state. In this state, it has been put solely by the positive argument, and all which analogy does is to uphold the native power of this argument by warding off the adverse forces that have been brought to bear against it. The last of its two services might delude some into the imagination that analogy contributes something to the stock of affirmative reasons for Christianity. I should be very cautious of asserting this, but... It at least repels the inroad of any such invader as might offer to take away this stock or any part of it. I wish not to overstate its power, as I think has been occasionally done by Butler in some incidental expressions that occur here and there in the volume, and yet I feel that I cannot render sufficient homage to the argument which first, addressing itself to the subject matter of Christianity, relieves it of all disproof and pronounces it worthy of a trial, and then, addressing itself to the evidence of Christianity, relieves it of all objection, and so makes good to this evidence the undisturbed possession of all the entireness and efficiency which natively belongs to it. 33. The objections removable from the Christian religion by the power of analogy are such as affirm certain parts of it to be incredible, whether considered as facts or considered as making against the moral attributes of God. The first set of objections are set aside by the exhibition of similar facts in the constitution and course of nature, and the second set of objections are set aside by evincing that they hold equally good against the system of natural religion. He seeks no absolute solution of these objections. He only shows that they equally lie against the natural economy of things, which economy then, if consistent either with the natural or the moral government of the world, proves that for aught of force which is in these objections, the author of this economy of nature may indeed be the author of the economy of revelation also. 34. Let me repeat once more that I doubt if analogy can go further than simply neutralize objections, whether against the substance of Christianity or against the proof of it. Her office I hold to be entirely a defensive one. Under her power, every honest inquirer will abandon the region of disbelief and take his station at the margin which separates this region from its opposite. It is by means of other implements and other influences that he will be led to enter on the region of positive conviction. 35. There are certain other objections incidentally noticed by our great author and which cannot be met by his peculiar argument. They do not lie within the scope of analogy, and if grounded on truth, it would not be in the power of an analogical argument at all to make head against them. 
any obvious and flagrant immorality in the system of Christianity, or any distinct contradiction between one part of it and another, or any assertion by it relative to the things of nature and history, and which I know from previous and independent knowledge to be false. These would outweigh the force of all its evidences, and justify men in setting it aside as a hateful and wicked imposture. Such objections require a direct treatment on their own proper ground, and it was of these I spoke when I called your attention to the highly important result that issues from the argument which is held regarding them. End of section 16. Section 17 of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conclusion The Prayer we draw near to thee, O God, under a deep sense both of our dependence as creatures and of our unworthiness as sinners. Yet sinners though we be, we draw near not without hope, but rather with full assurance of heart in the blood of the everlasting covenant. We obey the invitations of thy gospel, we plead its assurances, and build our confidence before thee on the exceeding great and precious promises of thy word. We pray for mercy to pardon, we pray for grace to help us. May the blood which cleanseth from all sin cleanse us from our sin, and may the spirit which quickens even the dead in trespasses quicken us into a new moral and spiritual existence. 36. I shall be strictly observant of my promise to expatiate no more on the substance or contents of the volume which we have now traversed, but let me not take leave of it without expressing my hope that many of you have imbibed along the passage the sound and philosophical spirit of its great author. I have already given repeated intimation that, viewed as a Christian composition, I do not regard it as being sufficiently impregnated with the Sal Evangelicum, and that even his own principles are not fully and practically followed out. He is like one who, with admirable skill, lays down the distances and directions of a land which himself hath not travelled far into. The wisdom of Butler is more like the wisdom of the letter than the wisdom of the spirit, yet let us never forget that it is the letter animated and lighted up by the spirit which constitutes the pabulum of Christian instruction. The spirit, in revealing truth to the mind, reveals to it nothing that is beside or beyond the record. Still, it is Bible instruction that we receive even under the teaching of the spirit, though, if I may so express myself, it is the Bible in illuminated characters. Spiritual Christianity takes the very shape and dimensions and outline and whole structure of literal Christianity. The lessons of the Spirit are but the lessons of the Word made impressive, or of the Word brought clearly and powerfully home, and without sitting in judgment on the personal religion of Butler, it is the part of the Christian world to own their deepest obligations to the man who hath so nobly asserted the authority of that Word over all the darkling speculations of human fancy, and who hath evinced to us by the truest of all philosophy, that we should cast down every lofty imagination and bring all our thoughts into the captivity of its obedience. 37. The service which Bacon rendered to science, that service hath Butler rendered to Christianity. The former succeeded in nullifying the pride and the presumption of all human excogitations respecting the natural constitution of the universe and reduced the work of discovery in things of science to the business of observation. The latter hath, with like success, demonstrated the vanity of man's preconceptions respecting the moral constitution of the universe, and reduced the work of discovery in things sacred to the business of observation also. If rightly tutored by the one, we go forth with the plumb line and the balance and the crucible and the telescope and all the apparatus of experiment on the observation of nature. If rightly tutored by the other, we go forth with the grammar and the lexicon and the polyglot and all the apparatus of criticism on the observation of scripture. In the first enterprise, we patiently collect the facts of what God hath done in the world, and out of these we build up the entire system of our philosophy. In the second enterprise, we patiently collect the facts of what God hath written in the Bible, and out of these we build up the entire system of our faith. There is an identity of spirit and principle in the two processes, and whether they be the works of God or the word of God that we investigate, it is alike the lesson of those great masters that we evince the truest wisdom by sitting down to the task with the docility of little children. And whatever the disposition may be in the philosophers of our present day towards Christianity, the days have been when the men of most colossal strength and proudest achievement in science pressed forward to do her reverence, as when Newton transferred his mighty intellect from the study of the works of God to the study of his word. 38. 
and now that we have made full trial of one book and actually finished it, I leave the question to yourselves as to the best method of learning theology, whether from a succession of lectures alone or from a succession of textbooks supplemented by lectures and mixed up with the familiar remarks and urgent reiterations of an expounder. Reiterations persevered in till every misconception be rectified and all resistance be driven in. I ask in which of the two ways you can be made to drink more deeply into the existent literature of a science or have a compact and memorable impression of its truths effectually wrought upon you. Is there any comparison between the efficiency of the methods, whether the object be to multiply the lessons of the course or to revise them? Do you not experience that, in one way, the instruction is far more abundant in its quantity as well as far more enduring in the fruits of it? and that by a series of actual deliverances on every topic, whether direct or incidental, which occurs in the volume, you are not only rendered masters of the book, but masters of the subject of the book. And we speak not merely of the effect it must have on the cast and habitude of your thoughts by being brought into collision with authors of such staple as Butler and Paley. We speak of the virtue that lies in your own preparations. We speak of your abridgments and your analysis and your written memoranda these substantial products of your own well-exercised intellects, and while we appeal to all this palpable handiwork as the enduring memorial of your industry, we confidently ask whether, in the actual moulding of your conceptions on the matters of Christianity, there be not effects which, though by their nature unseen, are alike enduring. 39. Were my own conceptions on the subject of theological seminary realized, there would be distinct classes for the students of each year, in which case the whole number would be broken up into forties or fifties, and the examinational process would circulate with far greater rapidity, so as to complete the rotation somewhat oftener than once in a fortnight. The charm and efficacy of the method would thus be brought out in far more convincing illustration, but even as it is, and without the advantage of this division, your own appearances have fully vindicated the course that we have taken, and from the highly intellectual exhibitions which many of you have made, I feel abundantly encouraged and warranted to persevere in it. 40. In one respect you will find Paley less laborious than Butler, and in another respect more so. You will have to prepare a greater quantity of the latter, but then, in the description of his lucid pages, you will experience the facility and even the entertainment of light reading. Let me recommend that you give a portion of each evening in the week to your preparations, if you find that the space traversed by the three days' examinations actually require it. Above all, let me recommend the construction of an ample notebook, grounded on this inestimable work, and leaving space in it for our own supplementary observations. Remember that we are now entering on the positive evidence for Christianity, and you will find it a precious acquisition to have a manuscript written by your own hands presenting the outline of this very extensive argument with notices of the authors who have most signalized themselves by the contributions which they have made to it. End of section 17. End of Lectures on Butler's Analogy by Thomas Chalmers.